Hey everybody, welcome or welcome back to Rollback. What is Rollback? Well, Rollback is where we serve up the very best of our pre-video episodes to YouTube for the very first time. And today we've got a special one for you. Ever since he snatched a video camera from his father's closet at 15, Steve-O has lived for attention. And the Jackass star learned early on that the public adoration he craved escalated in lockstep with his outrageous behavior. The further he pushed the envelope, the more America's favorite prankster felt loved and alive. But of course, it was never enough. And as insanely dangerous as his stunts eventually became, it was drugs and alcohol that ultimately brought Steve to his knees. In this episode, from May 15 of 2016, we go beyond quote unquote, Steve-O, the alter ego to meet Stephen Glover, the human being behind the stuntman and provocateur. And what makes it all the more unique, Steve's father, Ted, joined us as well. So this is a conversation about the damage inflicted by addictions. It's about recovery, forgiveness, and spiritual evolution. But most of all, it's about the love between a father and a son. So this is me, Steve-O, and Ted Glover. How's it going? Good, go, man. Hi, hey, brother. Good yeah, man. Good to see you. My dad. Hi. Hi. I'm Rich. How's it going? Proper. Ted, Rich. How's it going, man? I'm so excited about this. Dude, man, thanks for doing it. Yeah, of course, man. Yeah, I remember people asking me about you and your podcast before realizing that I, that I knew you. Man, I have so many questions for you. I got a lot for you. Steve, let me just hear how you sound. Yeah, dude. Perfect. So it's so cool you came here, man. I really oh, man. It. It's uh, it's more fun for me because then I get to see like how other people sure. are and everything like that. Right, yeah. So I, you know, I don't mind it. I mean, I have a little studio, but I live so far away. Like getting people to come out to where I am is right. tough. Sometimes I do it at the house, but. So does that mean we're underway? We're going. All right, here ready, we are. Ready it's to a rock. podcast. We got Steve. We got Ted. Thank you for doing this. And then Ted, by the way, is, is uh, Papa Steve-O. That's right. That's, uh, <laughs> Have you ever done a podcast before? Never done a podcast. Well, Dad's probably never a... listened to a podcast I either. <laughs> Walter! <laughs> It's gonna be it's it's gonna be good. I got so many questions for you, Ted. For me? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, come on. What's it like to be Steve-O's dad? Uh, I didn't know that you would even be aware that I was here, and I thought I'd quietly. I, I, I advertised you. <laughs> yeah. I, I made a big deal. Well, it was your it. yeah, it was your idea, but it was a right. Really, it's a great and and, idea. and I, I think that there's so much stuff that Dad would um, really um, bring value to, and and that that I, I, I kind of curse myself for not having exploited you more. Capitalized on my right, greater wisdom. Right, right. <laughs> Dad's really that uh, because with the jackass history of Bam beating up his dad and and sort of right. being generally like terrible to his parents, you know, like in, in my worst, uh, at the the depths of my alcoholism and drug addiction, you know, like there was never a point when I ever really shit on my family, mm-hmm. you know, like uh, it's just not been my my shtick. It's never been my deal, and. Um, even at my worst, I've always, you know, I, I, I always made it home, you know, like for Christmas, this and that, you know, and uh-huh. for the most part, except for having no regard for my, you know, my own well-being. And, and of course, in turn, that's kind of shitting on your family. Well, I think that, like, that, <laughs> that, you know, behind all the insanity, you know, lives a pretty sweet kid, you know, with a, with a big heart. I think that's a big part of the jackass success. I, I, and I, I don't know. I think, I think people, I think people and, get that on some level about you, but I don't know if they really get right. it in the way that like, you know, we don't know each other that well, but I know you a little bit. Pre- like I, well. I know, I know what you're like when the camera's off and sure. you know, you're a lot more grounded, you know, shockingly more grounded than I think people would imagine. I think that's fair to say. And I should also say, uh, say thank you for the kind words. It's uh, it's appreciated. Right. And we've known each other for, going on. I mean, I just uh, turned eight years sober. Right. So, Congrats, uh, man. so That's amazing. I mean, I guess I was probably, we probably met, I was about a, about a year into yeah, it. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's about right. So we've known each other, you know, the, somewhat peripherally for a good seven yeah. years, but. Yeah, 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 for sure. I but, mean, it's been, what an insane journey, man. <laughs> right. You know, I mean, it's a freaking miracle, you know. And when I'm driving over here, uh, you know, I listened to uh, the Marin uh, interview the other day and I, and it was it was before you had gotten back to me and I'm like 
fuck, man, what am I going to talk to this guy about? He just, he just like, ah, told the so whole thing with Mark. And then you're like, I want to have my dad on the podcast. And I was like, that's genius. You know? <laughs> so they're like, that's perfect. Like this has never happened before. So this is really It's never sweet. happened before. And, um, and, and selfishly, I, I, you know, because I consider you to be uh, an authority on not just a vegan lifestyle, but, but health and nutrition in general. Selfishly, I kind of hope that, that we can get into a little bit of a, a discussion that, that might influence you know, the, the old man to, to be a little bit more careful about, about what, what he does and doesn't right. eat. Like, you know, sort of, and, and I, I classify dad as being um, kind of like uh, he, he, he sort of, I don't know, like defensive of, of, of certain lifestyle habits that until there's a burden of proof and and it is it's conclusive and you can not only like uh, prove why something's bad but boil it down into uh, a manageable sound bite that can be uttered in just one sentence he's going to hang on to bad habits until right. and, you know like and, and the first case in point being uh, diet diet soda well, I, first of all, I appreciate the, the desire to, you know, want to see the facts. You know, that's, that's a, that's a uh, admirable quality. So I don't uh, disparage you for that. Right. I, uh, I the tone say- of voice says it all. <laughs> <laughs> but the way Steve, Steve isn't quite right on, on what he said. I, I was trying to explain it with an advertising analogy. You know, I started my career in the middle 1960s and was in marketing pretty well all the way. So mm-hmm. a fair amount of experience uh, dealing with advertising agencies and copy and all the rest of it. And I said to Steve, if you've got a product that supposedly polishes furniture better, uh, reduces cavities in your teeth, uh, example I used was head and shoulder shampoo that controls dandruff. The first, Controls, the first thing, the first thing you got to start out with, is, what is the claim? What are you saying that this product stands for and is capable of doing? Mm-hmm. The second level, once you've established the claim, is to define the support for the claim. Why does the product do? Well, what how it's do you claimed substantiate to do. Right. the claim? And uh, in the case of my early marketing days when Head & Shoulders was literally first introduced as a new product, uh, a key ingredient in the formula was a zinc compound referred to as ZPT, and uh, that became the reason why. Uh, Head & Shoulders controls dandruff because of this unique ingredient, ZBT, which does all the terrific stuff. So that's the support for the claim. <coughs> mm-hmm. then, well, the th- then the third level is the documentation, that the support isn't all bullshit, right. but the clinical study that <laughs> absolutely proves it. Back to Steve's analogy, I got to get to level two. Gotcha. I got to understand <laughs> right. why something is good, but I won't necessarily well, beat let, it let, to death to get all the scientific studies back here. Let, let's jump right in with, with Diet Coke, okay? So, so now, Dad, tell me, like, why do you feel so strongly about continuing to uh, drink Diet Coke? There's got to be some cognitive dissonance, because you know it's not a health food. Well, <laughs> I, all of my life, I've been fighting... <laughs> I've been fighting a battle of weight gain. I mean, I'm not overweight, but I very easily could be. And so my first conscious thought about healthy eating or drinking or whatever uh, was focused on calories more than anything else. Mm -hmm. So I concluded pretty quickly that a soda that has zero calories has got to be more beneficial uh, in terms of weight control than a soda that's got several hundred calories. So that kind of launched me on the uh, on the diet soda kick, and okay. working in the industry didn't hurt. Dad used to be a, a, a Pepsi Cola, right? Uh-huh. So diet and Pepsi or diet Coke? diet Pepsi? Diet. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sorry, I said a terrible it, it, word. It, it, no, it, it took 30 years to get out of that. When Steve was little, he wasn't allowed to have Coke. And uh, if we were in a restaurant that was a Coke exclusive, he drinks seven of them. I hear you, <laughs> but the, but that that's you realize that's a myopic perspective because you're overlooking all the the chemicals and all the additives and all the other no, things. No, it, no, it's not myopic. <laughs> all right. <laughs> We're off like we're way in the weeds now. No, we're not. No, no, no. Let me let me let me define it. This is a first step 
in an evolutionary journey and not to be disparaged. All right. Okay, well, we'll but, 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 <laughs> wait, wait, hold on a second, Dad. What the hell are you talking about? Like, um, what he said, 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 I know what's bad. I'm saying, hey, I know it's going to contribute less to obesity. And as I progress this evolution, then, I'm yeah. realizing that it's not great. And so I'm drinking more <laughs> right, water right. and less soda. Uh, okay, but I have but not can, eliminated can, it completely. But, but can we, um, let me, let me, can, can, can you help me yeah, to yeah. get him to this second level or whatever he's talking about <laughs> right. to yes. understand like why it's terrible? Let me, about diet soda or yeah. just let's, or about the vegan lifestyle? Let's go with, let, let, let's, let's try to knock out diet soda real All quick. Right. So, well, first, as far as diet soda is concerned, your, your equation presumes that if you're not drinking diet soda, that you're gonna be drinking regular soda. So that's error number one, right? Like well, neither of those are good, so well, maybe, maybe try to work on overcoming yeah, that presumption. I agree with that, but when you start on your journey, less bad is moving in the direction of good. Uh-huh, right. Right, but when you're... So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. I don't even know where to begin with this. <laughs> <laughs> I told you. I know. He's a logic machine, and he yeah. uses his logic very irrationally. I could talk about I could talk about the vegan stuff and the, the animal products in your diet if you want to talk about that. Uh, well, I, I, I here I got kind of a separate issue. If the entire vegan proposition is based on cruelty to animals, Steve has made sure that I viewed the appropriate video. Uh, Dad's mm-hmm. amazing. I, 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 like, for, for those who aren't familiar with the documentary called Earthlings, it's probably the most upsetting expose of, of uh, animal cruelty. And, and it's a documentary that breaks down chapter by chapter the ways in which humans exploit animals. You know, first being, and not necessarily in this order, but, uh, but for food, for, for clothing, for entertainment, for animal testing, and, and I feel like I'm leaving out one, but uh, it's oh yeah, and for for uh, pets, um, it, it's just the most like heart wrenching, just Super uh, upset, upset upsetting thing. And 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 uh, my stepmom at the time when we uh, when I when I brought this documentary home, it was important to to, to show this to dad and and my stepmom. The opening credits hadn't even rolled, and my stepmom went running out of the room like, like, I can't stand, I, I can't see this, like, like almost like I'm crying or, or crying. And dad, like, sat there and, and watched it through. Now, while this documentary was, was, you know, playing, I remember thinking to myself, I'm already vegan. Like, I'm already vegan. Like, why am I doing this to myself to watch this? Right. Like, it just made me feel a super vegan. And, um, and dad... You know, like uh, just sort of bonding with me, like they like, actually managed to not fall asleep, which was which was pretty impressive, <laughs> and um, and made it all the way through from beginning to end, watched the whole thing. Now the next day, we went out to lunch, and both dad and stepmom uh, order meat. <laughs> they order like I mean, whatever it was. I think it was like a, a, a Caesar with chicken all over it or something. And um, I remember just thinking, wow, like my, my, my take on it at the time was, well, you know, um, I, I, I genuinely and, and not, not to be mean or anything. I just, I just can't respect the uninformed decision to run out of the room. Like I can't right. bear to see this and then not change the way you live. It's basically acknowledging that there's something really wrong there, and just just running out, and and I don't want to watch it, and then and then not changing the way I have trouble respecting that. But I had to say, even at the time, you know, the fact that Dad like just parked down on the sofa, watched this whole documentary from beginning to end, became fully informed, like it, with all of the the you know really really difficult to watch uh, you know video component. And, and just completely informed and then just sat down and ordered himself some chicken the next day. Like, I don't like it, but I, on, on, a, on a level, I had to just respect yeah, that. Like, it, it's an, it was an informed decision. It's sort of decision. like how Upton Sinclair, you know, would say, if you, you, you can eat meat if you want, but first, like, tour the slaughterhouse so you know what you're getting into. Right. So you're not going at it with right. blinders. And, and it's more and more difficult. We're more and more divorced as consumers from the process by which our food is made as a result of ag gag laws and all sorts of, you know, regulatory actions that prevent the consumer from having that transparent uh, relationship with food manufacturers. Right. Jumping completely to a a tangent, but somewhat relevant. Uh, America is one of only four or five countries with a death penalty. 
others including Saudi Arabia and China. And it's been opined that the fastest way to get rid of the death penalty would be to put the executions in television and force the masses to watch them. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't think that that would be the case. I don't know. I don't know. But, 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 but it's kind of, to your point, if you look at all the bad stuff that's going on, you are more likely to be repelled by it than if you stick your head in the sand and pretend right. it doesn't exist. Well, it's a common saying that if slaughterhouses but, had uh, windows, you know, or, or, or glass walls that you could see through, and, and everybody was just seeing what was yeah, going on, yeah. then and a lot more people would be... Yeah, but I, I'm going to use my logic now, I guess, in an <laughs> inappropriate way. Logic is usually good, but this one, a little bit inappropriate. Um, I got a lot of respect for Steve's care about animals, and... Uh, uh, if I were looking at it only on a health benefit basis and not on a cruelty to animals basis, uh, I could pretty quickly conclude that three quarters vegan is better than no vegan and have a steak now and again and you're still leading a healthier life and it is not like alcohol or drugs mm-hmm. which become addictive and one slip and you're down the slippery slope again. Yeah, so that. I, buy, uh, I, 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 buy. I, I disagree there because when, like, when, once you're, when, when, when you've established like a principle of it's wrong to to well, harm well, animals, yeah, well, sorry, then, sorry, then harming animals like once every few months or, or no, 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 wait, wait. I, I'm breaking the uh-huh. argument into two component parts. Okay. I'm dealing first with the health issue as it relates to the consumer. The animal issue is a separate issue. Right, okay. Okay, I'm, as the consumer, uh, three quarters vegan has got to be healthier than zero vegan. Now going to your point about cruelty to animals, and this is where I get a little bit unglued, uh, Steve doesn't wear leather, and I respect that. On the other hand, the industry has become so incredibly uh, good at designing fake leather that's indistinguishable from the real product, if Steve goes to a function wearing a belt or shoes that is indistinguishable from real leather, everybody thinks that he's okay. Yeah, I've thought about that too. When I go out right. in public, like I try to wear stuff that doesn't look like leather right. at all so, so, so people won't get confused in that way. I mean, you know, that's sort of a, you know, we're getting into like the minutia, minutia. of a little I bit. Know, I mean, we, I think no, that, but, but, but the, backing up, I wanted to get back to something you said earlier, which was, your presumption of approaching this issue from a perspective of, of ethics and, and uh, the, treatment, the mistreatment of animals. But there's also, like you began to allude to, the health considerations and also profoundly the environmental implications. So there's a, right. I'm sure you saw a Cowspiracy. We, we, I, right? I watched so, it with Dad. <clears throat> you did, okay. Got Dad to watch Cowspiracy and, and he showed up to, to lunch the next day. And ordered <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so, well, the, so the, the way I look at it is like this. The, 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 it, checks every, it checks every box because uh, when you break down the, you know, the system of factory farming and industrialized animal agriculture and the massive deleterious impact of that industry on planetary health, everything from species extinction to ocean dead zones to water use to land use to rainforest, you know, rainforest deforestation, everything about that. It is so profoundly more harmful than all of transportation combined, et cetera. Then you look at health and you realize we're in the midst of this unspeakable healthcare crisis right now. One out of every three Americans dies of heart disease. By 2030, 50% of Americans are going to be diabetic or pre-diabetic. 70% of Americans are obese or overweight. And I would contend that we actually are addicted on some level, not maybe the way that you become addicted to cocaine, but there is an addictive element to some of the foods that we eat, particularly some of the more highly processed foods. So by removing animal products from your diet, you're taking out an insurance policy on your health to not become one of those chronic lifestyle illness statistics. You're doing uh, right by the environment and you're sparing the life of animals that are being mistreated. So when I look at, at it from like a 10,000 foot down uh, perspective, I see all these reasons why. Yeah, one you know, stop shop. Yeah, so Check every that's box. how I, I tend to think about it. But I also, um, you know, I'm somebody who, I don't go around preaching and telling people what they should or they shouldn't do. Like, I live my life, I'm happy to talk about it, if people wanna hear about it, if they're interested, I'll answer questions, but I don't sit in judgment of anyone else's lifestyle. But I do think that we're at, like, you know, a chronic point uh, in, uh, in, our, in our planet where we have to, you know, really figure some stuff out because right. we're, we're headed in a not so good direction. Well, let me, I, I'm, I'm, I'm interrupting on purpose and I apologize for that, but uh, I think, it's, I don't think it's fair to say that we don't sit in judgment 
of, uh, of people's lifestyles because I think that we, that we do. I think what we refrain from doing is attacking them and preaching to them. Mm -hmm. it's a, but, but, at the, but we can't be removed from judgment, I don't think, and, and really having this Fair conversation. Enough. Fair enough. Well, let, me, let me try to put a pragmatic twist in this. Uh, the principal home is in Florida, and we got the great big plastic recycling bins, mm -hmm. and I recycle like a trooper. I believe in it. I make sure that everything goes out. A soda can or a plastic bottle uh, will never go into the uh, trash. We have an apartment in London uh, that we spend, you go to in the summer. And it's a small apartment. You know, it's a London. Uh, England. England. London, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, Not uh, London, Ontario. And, <laughs> and the, uh, you know, there, 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 there's a space constraint. And to have a separate container for recycling wouldn't fit into the kitchen. And so it is a significantly greater pain in the ass to think about recycling soda cans in our place in London than it is in Florida. So I do the cost-benefit analysis. Uh, I'd like to help save the world uh, within reasonable uh, costs of effort and time. I'll be absolutely committed, as I am in Florida, but if the difficulty of doing that you know, reaches a certain level, the cost-benefit clicks in, and I think, hey, if I throw uh, yeah, 100 soda cans out in the course of the summer, I don't think the world is going to be damaged as much. Soda cans. Well, the greater point that you're the greater point that you're making is that if you really want to if you really want to make change on a mainstream mass level, the healthy choice or the choice that's better for you know for society and the planet at large has to be the convenient choice. I think that's right. Yeah, right. And, and I think and, the real and, point. And, and there, there's another point. That movie. That, that's that's the one we saw at Christmas time, right? With with the map and how, how, how the all the cows. The, and the how, conspiracy right. one, right? Yeah, and that dad, dad has has shit on every single one of these dogs. <laughs> no, I'm not shitting. Well, no, I know. I, 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 I remember I, you said you came to lunch the next day. You ordered yourself it, some well, meat. It was. You, it, uh, you, it, you said you said that the, that um, the main the main thing that the conspiracy thing was called was consumption of water, right? If I remember yeah. correctly, and they were talking about. Um, you know, like imagine, uh, uh, you know, it, leaving the hose running and the, if the neighbor left the hose running and it, and it flooded everywhere, you know, you'd say something and you'd tell him to stop. Dad's point was, he said, he said, I don't, I don't buy it because um, it's impossible to, um, to use this water for, for, for this, uh, you know, uh, agriculture without effectively recycling it one way or the other. So you don't lose the water, is what Dad was saying. Okay, if we could respond to that, that would be helpful. I'm not, sure I, that, I'm that not sure I totally understand. You're saying that that, 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 consumer, that that water has to get used one way or the other and it's not no, finding I'm its not way sure to consumers? I, I'm not sure I said that. I, mean, I, I, mean, you, I think you, the you, bigger you, issue is that, is that using animals as a uh, repository for food is inherently um, wasteful and unsustainable because you have to cycle all these crops through an animal and you end up with less food than if you just fed the human beings the crops themselves. And so you have to pour all these resources into growing an animal to the size that it can be slaughtered for, for food. And because of that, uh, it's just it's inefficient. And as a business person, you know, economies of scale and efficiencies, I would think, are something that is always on your mind. Well, that's the same argument that undermines the case for electric or hybrid cars. Because everybody says, hey, they don't use any gasoline. Mm -hmm. And they use little or no gasoline, depending on which model you buy. But nobody calculates the renewable or non-renewable energy which is required to make the to batteries create, and yeah, yeah, yeah. you know run the turbines that provide the electricity that kind of all gets lost in the shuffle all right so ted how are we how are we going to solve all these problems <laughs> well i've got a solution for the water <laughs> you do <laughs> <laughs> and i want to use an analogy with the uh, oil industry because if you go back six or seven years everyone was talking about peak oil the world was running out uh, Saudi Arabia was hitting its peak and about to decline. The, uh, I forget the name of the field, but in the Gulf of Mexico, off the coast of Mexico, was declining by 15 or 20 percent every year. Uh, this was a dire thing. And guess what happened? American ingenuity came up with the technology of hydraulic fracturing, and suddenly the world is awash with a surplus. And my view is, I'm not saying this would solve it, but an equally constructive avenue 
maybe to approach in tandem for the water problem is to concentrate on l much larger scale desalination technology. Mm -hmm. If you could take the salt water, uh, and, and the technology exists but not on a scale or cost structure that would make it viable to uh, water the crops across America, but why couldn't water be taken from the ocean, desalinated, used to uh, uh, irrigate crops, and you get the dual benefit of not only solving the water shortage, but at least partially addressing the, you know, the global warming, the ice cap melting, and yeah, the, 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 the rising, the rising yeah, ocean the that's going to wipe out level. Florida in 100 we, years. I talked about this with Joe Rogan on his podcast, and my theory on this is that it seems like, uh, it seems like desalinating the ocean would be like elementary school chemistry. Like, why can't we just get the, the salt out of right. the ocean? It seems like it would be simple, but it's not. It's very difficult. It takes a lot of energy to do it. It's so complicated. In fact, I think that God rigged it because if it was easy, those oceans well, would be dry it, by now because human beings are idiotic that yeah, way. Yeah, look, look, we're, 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 I'm, not saying I'm, it's, I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying it's viable. I'm just saying that if, if you are trying to take, forget just the American public, you know, the world public, and get them off eating meat, I submit that that is an even bigger challenge than developing desalination plants on a vast commercially viable <laughs> uh -huh. scale. He might and have if, a point. <laughs> and if you were to pursue both avenues simultaneously, you would probably have a greater chance of success in pursuing one only. We still don't have enough land to raise the number of animals to anticipate the needs of a planet that's going to swell to 11 billion people by 2100. Yeah, I think that's right. Now, the other thing, if you look at two separate industries with related issues, when I was in my 20s, it was perfectly common to go out on a Friday night, get totally wasted, and drive home at 2 o'clock in the morning. At the time when Steve was uh, little, we lived in Connecticut, about an hour's drive from Manhattan. And Steve's mom and I would literally go down to central Manhattan after work, leaving the kids with a babysitter, uh, drink ourselves shit-faced until 1 o'clock in the morning, uh -huh. and then drive home along the uh, Hutchison River Merritt Parkway. If you know it, there's no lights and it's a winding road. Uh, I sometimes marvel that I'm still alive today to yeah, tell the story. Yeah, those are the good old days. Like no, Mad no, Mad no, Mad no, no wait, 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 wait. They're not the good old days. Uh -huh. But here's the difference. Uh, over time, there was a societal change, and drinking and driving not only became uh, uh, penalized criminally, uh, it became socially unacceptable. Uh, and once it becomes socially unacceptable and people are embarrassed to do it, that changes habits. Uh, I spent four years uh, in the cigarette industry as head of the uh, Latin America operations. For, uh, for R.J. Reynolds tobacco. Right, that's and, amazing. And, <laughs> and, and uh, I remember at the time, the industry was far more concerned about losing social acceptability than losing lawsuits. Yeah, because once that tide shifts, you're done. Yeah, and I think that the if you, know, if you really want to change uh, behavior, there's got to be a hook that influences people to uh, look down on the meat eater the way currently people look down on the smoker. I mean, if you're at a mm -hmm. social function or a business function and somebody's got to go out for a cigarette break, you know, at best they're... Uh, lower level socio-demographics and probably they're an asshole. Uh, if you could convey that kind of thinking. Uh, <laughs> well, I think we're headed in that direction as a result of some pretty interesting technological advances and what's going on with the kind of meat alternative industry with Beyond Meat and Hampton Creek. These, these are really pioneering, interesting companies that are coming up with everything from burgers to mayonnaise to cookie dough and beyond, and this is only gonna enhance. There's companies like Memphis Meats that are gr <coughs> they're growing in petri dishes, like steaks and all kinds of crazy. The, the technology that's going into this is amazing, and I think we're not there yet, certainly, but five, 10, 15, maybe 20 years from now, when we're able to produce foods that are indistinguishable in taste and amino acid profile and nutrients and all of that from animal products, then I think we will get to a tipping point where mainstream culture will shift their perspective, because why participate in the killing of an innocent animal when you can get this alternative that actually is more nutritious, tastes just as good, et cetera. 
I think there may be a shortcut to that. And this is a conversation we had at dinner the other night. Uh, I don't like vegan, uh, call it rip-off burgers or... Mock yeah, meat. Mock, mock anything. Yeah. I that... mean, anybody who is, has not yet converted and enjoys a good steak or a good hamburger or a good piece of chicken is not going to particularly enjoy... It's getting better, though. It's getting better, but it's gone from very bad to somewhat bad. Mm -hmm. Here is the suggestion. We were at, I forget the name of that restaurant the other night. And, Veggie Girl. And there was one dish in the menu which I would classify as real food. The Bombay Bowl. Right. And I loved it. And I'm not going to go back to the same restaurant if they've only one dish in the menu that I like. But I don't understand why these restaurant proprietors don't recognize that there's a huge... The value in, in creating meals it, that aren't it, pretending to be something that... Could, right. Could, I think there was an idea that, that Veggie Grill had to have those sort of chicken sandwiches and burgers and the like to kind of get a mainstream audience in, but they're they're actually pivoting right now and and doing exactly what you, you're saying. They're going to be putting more, you know, sort of whole food, you know, real food uh, items on the menu. Right, and they've been incredibly successful, too. I mean, they, this chain, it's a Southern California operation that has just exploded, and they've got new new locations opening up. I was just up in uh, Portland, Oregon. They have veggie grill. Oh, they do up there? Uh-huh. You know what's opening in Portland pretty soon? What's that? This, uh... This uh, all vegan grocery store called Vegan, like it's a full grocery store, but everything right. in there is vegan. It's this guy who used to be a Mercedes Benz executive, uh, and started this right. chain in Berlin. There's a couple in Germany, and uh -huh. he's, they're introducing can, their first one in the U.S. Can, can, I don't know when exactly, but can, so, uh, can you can you buy Tide detergent and Heineken beer there? That's a good question. I because I'll tell you, I, I got a real bitch against Whole Foods. I hate that place because. <laughs> <laughs> Because whole and you can afford it, <laughs> well, but uh, the, the cost is not the issue. You, you walk in, and in the front end, they got fresh vegetables that are pretty good. They got a lot of meat down the back, but the steaks are too big. I'm eating less meat, which I guess is a step in the right uh -huh. direction. So Steve's doing something. Instead of having a 20 ounce <laughs> steak, I'm happy with a 12 ounce steak. Um, but in the middle, they got all these foo foo products, and if you want to do a total shop there, you can't. So you got to go to Whole Foods for this, but you still got to go to Publix or Ralph's or wherever you live oh, you uh, in order in order to fill out your your, your shopping list. Like what? Yeah, what, well, what are you trying to okay. get? <laughs> I want to get beer. I want to get detergent. Beer I want to get toothpaste. Something? I'm sure they do. But they they don't have the same brands. They try to they try to get these niche craft brands. <laughs> if, if 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 you got. <laughs> All right. All right. All right. Hold on. Let's like. And, and paper towels. Can you get paper towels in Whole Foods? I, I want to talk about like how your your dad clearly has a methodical, like logically based plotting mind. Like how I don't like the word plotting. Where you I don't like the from? word plotting. Not right. plotting. Leaping. 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 With, leaping. with, with uh, well, real, real quick, the, I remember this was, uh, I've, I've been on a kind of a crusade to try it because I mean, I love my dad so much. And, you know, dad just turned 73. Um, in the family history, there's, uh, you know, there's, there's dementia, there's cancer, there's this and that. And, and uh, the idea of, of, uh, of, of losing my dad or, heaven forbid, any downgrade of, you know, dad, like, you know, downgraded in any way is just terrifying to me. And, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, I, I clutch to him. Like, last night we went to a Dodger game. And uh, I didn't say this, and I don't know why I'm saying it now, but... Um, when when they 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 run everybody through a metal detector and um and and as uh you know like you know dad said to to the very, very, almost like uh, sheepishly you know like for for my dad the way I understand the way I know him he said uh, I have a pacemaker and I can't go through the metal detector and mm -hmm. that dad when he said that that hit me so hard I didn't mean to do that but I'll tell you it, it just hit me really uh, really hard like like it was like uh, like uh. I was confronted with my dad's mortality, which uh, which I'm just not open to being confronted with, you know. Mm -hmm. And so for all these years, I've been, uh, you know, since I started taking care of myself, I've been really campaigning dad to take care of himself, you know, because uh, because I just I want to keep him around and I want him in the best shape I can have him. Um, so part of the campaign was I came home and, and I come home with documentaries all the time. And dad, you know, I was sort of a bonding thing, you know, father and son. He'll he'll watch just about whatever I bring home with him, you know, to, to spend time with me. And, and it's always geared towards trying to get dad to live more healthy. And uh, one of the trips home was uh, we sat down and watched the documentary Food Matters. Mm -hmm. 
dad always comes away with a take on it, some kind of a, a dad spin that, that just like just undermines everything he's just seen. Just right. like, like just, did we just watch the same movie? <laughs> right. Yeah. But uh, but the thing about food matters, and and Dan, this is a, you know for people who don't know, it's a documentary that basically like uh, extols the virtue of a raw food diet, and it says that you know if you go to Whole Foods or something, you know, and to buy your uh, your uh, your raw produce that 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 raw produce has lived on a, on a truck which which brought it from wherever it was farmed by the time it gets to the grocery store it's basically lost all of its nut- nutritional value and it's no longer you know, it's why it's so important that so you've got to go to uh, get get it from your local you know uh, local or orga- organic you know it's got to be the locally market, sourced you right. know farmers market like and so dad and I kind of understand it, and I even a little bit with him on, on that. Dad's like, okay, so the, this documentary, I, my takeaway is that no matter what you do, it's just not good enough. You know, even if I go to Whole Foods and buy all the the organic uh, veggies and this and that, they've lost all their nutrients. So no matter what you do, you're screwed. And that's right. So of, just oh. so just fuck it and like, <laughs> you know well, what I mean? Well, like, and I think that's well, a problem. Well, well, yeah, but let, but let me let me let me see. I I don't think vegetables hurt you. I, I suppose if they got too much pesticides in them, but to me, vegetables in the scenario you describe go from a plus to a zero. But what is scarier is that I grew up being told that white meat and fish were healthy alternatives to red meat, and when you see all these uh, uh, hormones, documentaries antibiotics. about the uh, the poultry, I mean that's doesn't look any safer than red meat and then you read about the uh, mercury in the water and you eat fish and you get mercury and there's one astonishing thing in the local paper in West Palm Beach a lot of sport fishermen up there uh, and they somehow did a study with families that uh, fished sufficiently regularly that their meal was based on fresh caught fish I think three times a week or more, four times a week or more. Very, very high incidence of catching their own fish in the waters off the uh, east coast of Florida. And so they, they, did some ki- they did some kind of a study, and I, for- I don't remember the specifics, but the conclusion was that these people had a particularly high incidence of something that was bad. Mm-hmm. Like even the fish that you caught off the local pier you know, had a bunch of crap in it. So Steve's right. I mean, you do get to a point where if everything is bad, and then, then you got the all the studies about how coffee used to be uh, dreadfully bad, and now coffee's okay. Uh, wine was bad, but if you drink a couple of bottle, glasses of wine every day, you got... Well, there was almost a Freudian slip in there. <laughs> <laughs> bottle, the word bottle almost came out. Well, one, w- once upon a time... A there, couple of bottles, yeah, I mean. Yeah. On. No, w- w- once upon a time, there was, and as Steve will acknowledge, I uh, don't think I was ever an alcoholic. I certainly was an alcohol abuser. I could drink a bottle of scotch in a night if it was a long enough night. Um, uh, Steve's stepmom, my wife, got me off of that. Uh, I'll have a couple of scotches a month. I'll have a single beer with most meals, mm-hmm. but it doesn't go beyond that. And yeah, Dad's a, you know the, in the book. He's the the problem drinker who's able to to moderate. You know when when right. given a sufficient reason. Well, that, that's what your book said. Not my book. That, that's what the big book said. <laughs> <laughs> not my book. <laughs> what does your book say? No, I, I'm sorry. Say when when, when 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 Steve when Steve first went into his recovery process, I read the uh, AA book. I went to Al-Anon. Mm-hmm. I made a point of trying to understand more clearly what it was all about. It was so funny. Dad, Dad, right. Dad, Dad says so. You know, because I told him right when I went in. Dad, you have to, you know, go to Al-Anon you know, because otherwise you have, you have to understand what, what I'm going through and you got to kind of figure out how to not screw it up, you know. And so you, I need to go to Al-Anon. Now, it's about six months in, Dad says, so I've been going to Al-Anon and I just don't quite understand it because it seems like the people in these Al-Anon meetings are there discussing their own problems. Mm-hmm. And I don't have any problems. <laughs> I don't have, I don't have any problems. whatsoever. He says, he says, I'm just here to to be supportive, of, you know, to to, you know what, to understand and support you and what you're doing. He went, though. He went, yeah. You know? and, and, and I remember thinking it was hilarious. And I said, Dad, next time just hand me a joint and a beer and call it a day. Right. <laughs> no, that's not fair. That, 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 right. No, of course. Let me ask you this. Let me, when, when, when Steve started getting super crazy, I mean, what was that like for you? Awful. I mean, it had to be torture. 
usually, almost invariably, I didn't see any footage until obviously long after it was taken. So the immediate life for death threat uh, wasn't an issue because I talked to him on the phone uh, the week or the day before. And what I was looking at uh, on the footage had obviously been filmed much longer ago mm-hmm. than that. And uh, both of my kids, especially my daughter, legitimately criticize me for what they call rose-colored glasses. I mean, I'll usually find a positive spin to put on just about anything. And uh, I did delude myself that, uh, yeah, there was a problem, but it was not as big a problem as you know, everybody said it was. That, you know, one way or another, things would sort themselves out. Mm-hmm. And uh, obviously they did, but not in the way I expected and not in any... Uh, sort of evolutionary change it was a crisis that you know right and 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 i had like i I essentially had that you know a a blackmail operation going where you know i I was self-sufficient you know with my own you know financial right uh so he couldn't tell you what to do yeah i wasn't i wasn't dependent on anybody financially or otherwise and so it was just sort of like a hey you know like i'm gonna need you to shut up and if you don't like that, then you're just sort of, a, I'm going to, you know, you're not going to be able to have a relationship with right. me. And so it was very much like on my terms. And, uh, and, and, and I was, you know, like typical for an alcoholic addict. Like, you know, if anybody brought up my lifestyle, my health, like my, my you know, my heaven forbid, my addiction, um, I just barked. Just I, I turned really, really harsh, really cold, really fast and, uh, and just shut down. And uh, that was the end of that conversation. And so nobody was invited to bring it up. And, and uh, if anybody did bring it up, they, they, I made them regret it in short order. And uh, if they persisted with it, then they jeopardized their ability to have a relationship with me at all. And so, right. so with Ted, it's a little bit of denial or just sort of believing that, you know, it'll somehow it's going to work out and just kind of and also being trained very well to to know not to bring it up you know to kind of dance around it but believe it or not there was a silver lining in all that because when steve had his ultimate collapse and was talking about riding his motorcycle through the Mm -hmm. glass window to land in the building across the street uh, I got calls from uh, Knoxville. I got right, calls when Knoxville from... was arranging the intervention, the idea was to have Dad be be physically present uh-huh. there. And, so let's um, just let's just paint that picture quickly because it's pretty interesting. I mean, I know you've right. told the story before, but I mean, you were you know you were headed towards the end there and going. Well, I was insane. in I was in dire straits. I mean, I, I my, my disease of, of addiction had progressed and um, you know for for many years. And I mean, my first time in rehab was 1995, and uh, I kind of blazed out of there and, and uh, you know, I, I had serious issues and by the end of it, um, by the end of it, I was just so, in such a bad way that I had effectively burned all the bridges in my career, um, you know, like uh, any, any good kind of a business opportunity I, I, I made go away. Um, I uh, just was, I, I became like, like quite truly uh, just a nasty person. I think that the way that we treat others um, is, is a pretty pure reflection of how we feel about ourselves. And my, my self-image, my self-esteem I had, had just been driven so low that I didn't have very many nice things to say or do towards others. And, mm-hmm. and uh, I, was, I was pretty nasty. I would, I would try to harm people's reputations. Uh, you know, I'd make them feel bad. I um not all the time but but that was a big chunk of what I was up to and and for the most part just becoming um you know inebriated and, and intoxicated uh you know to 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 really kind of dangerous levels and 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 I would sleep but once every you know, three days, and right. then I would so it's sleep like four days. Coke, PCP, ketamine, alcohol, <laughs> right? Weed. Everything except for crack and heroin. Uh-huh. Uh, like uh was part of my deal. I never really Why not? I had, I had boundaries for that, and yeah. the reason why is because I had been in uh, when I was in in rehab in 1995, when I was 20 years old. Um, I, I I mean I wasn't even of legal drinking age at that point. So when I got to the rehab, you know, it was just like I was just kind of getting my feet wet a little bit. I mean I wasn't. I was a proper alcoholic, mm. but once I was in the mix of of the rehab center uh, that I was in, it was like oh okay, well these people 
that have real problems made me feel a little bit better about myself by comparison i didn't have that much of an issue and um well, like the 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 way that it was set up you know that everybody was you know we'd be in our circle sort of talking about our feelings this and that and um every day one person would for the most part one person would leave and another person would show up this was the turnover right. and so whenever a new person showed up what you did you know that person would walk up to the to the to the to the circle and introduce yourself to the group and say what your drug of choice was and i learned really quickly that uh how people reacted to the new guy showing up if they were to say um my my drug of choice is powder cocaine like snorting cocaine they would like be smirking they'd be laughing like what a pussy you know they'd be basically saying under their breath but if the person was to say my drug of choice is crack cocaine, it would just be like all of a sudden, you know, avert eye contact. I don't want to know this guy. Right. He's not my roommate. You know, it was this sort of a feeling I got from it. And it was like, wow, like, I don't know what the difference is between powder cocaine and, and crack cocaine. But whatever that difference is, it is very significant because people would talk about about having careers with drugs and alcohol that, that went forever and ever, even heroin, you know, whatever, like just, they were maintained for years and years mm -hmm. and years. And then like from the moment they took their first hit of crack cocaine, like in, in just such a short time, they lost everything. Right. And, and I, I learned that really, really effectively when I was in that rehab, like whatever you do, just do not smoke crack. Right. And but the other PCP, thing, no problem. <laughs> PCP, yeah, like no problem. Ketamine. Right. I mean, I remember seeing, and then the, um, the nitrous and, and too. And heroin, heroin like, too. Yeah. Nitrous was terrible. I mean, what was it? There was some show was it, it yeah, MTV it, where you're at the end and you're like lying around and there's just like nitrous cartridges, like just surrounding you. Like right. Hundreds, and, hundreds and, and, and I around. never even really, I was kind of like ashamed of it at the time. Like I never really documented the, you know, like if I, if I had been, I was always trying to sort of like manage it and kind of like not. Like, you know, like, there's just no video footage that it, that lives that could do justice to, to the extent of the, the the nitrous consumption I was I was I was up to. That MTV special did a pretty good job, though. Yeah, yeah it did, I mean, it was it, dark. That was dark. Yeah, 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 yeah it was, it was dark, really and I don't dark. even. I, I frankly, I wouldn't actually wound up. I wouldn't watch it for the longest time. This was for those who don't know. They made a documentary. Um, I, I handed over like you know like a box of video when I was fairly new in rehab, and. Um, and just just hand it over with my blessing to make a documentary about you know about my my stuff, um, which uh, which is sort of a you know I don't know. Thank God I didn't go on that celebrity rehab because they were courting right. me like so persistently, and uh, they were they they were casting the second season of Dr. Drew's Celebrity Rehab when I was you know like a, a couple months like two or three months in, and. Um, they would, and I couldn't say, no, I don't want to do it. And then they kept like upping the money, upping right. the money and to the point where I was like considering it. It would have been the worst thing ever for me to, to, yeah. to do that. And I look at what I did do with this. Uh, it was called uh, Steve O Demise and Rise. And it was a basically, basically a documentary about my downward spiral and my subsequent um, early recovery. And, um, you know, it, it came and went, and um, I think for a lot of people who put their recovery out there in the way of some kind of a media, you know, if it's a, a documentary, if it's a TV show, or this and that, I think that people who sort of tout their recovery um, don't uh, don't typically do as well in recovery, you know, if you're sort of busy drawing attention to it and, and touting it and sort of congratulating yeah, yourself that for that's, it. That can become a problem. That quick. becomes really tricky because your, your whole motivation uh, becomes sketchy. And I, I remember being kind of aware and thinking of it as sort of that kind of a curse. And I think thinking and really second guessing myself, questioning like, why am I, why am I doing this? And like, and is, am I doomed? Am I dooming myself <coughs> to, to fail? A lot of it's about intention though. You know, it's like, right. is this being driven by ego and finance? finances or or is it a vehicle to you know be of service to other people i you know i i, I think it was a little bit of everything the honest truth i think is a little bit of everything it wasn't it wasn't purely uh positive motivation it wasn't um and, and it wasn't entirely negative at all but um looking at it and i remember um you know, kind of really agonizing over, like, am I putting myself, am I putting my recovery in jeopardy by putting this documentary out there? And one guy who really gave me, um, maybe maybe I, I, I said this recently, but uh, but it's James Hetfield from Metallica. Uh -huh. Because that documentary that Metallica did, which was called Some Kind of Monster, which which chronicled them uh, replacing a band member, 
um, recording a new to album. therapy, right? Together. And all the therapy. Yeah. And, and it, basically, at the end of the day, what it really was was a documentary about the, the lead singer of Metallica, James Hetfield, and his early recovery because he just is fresh out of rehab and he's got a limit on how much time he can spend rehearsing with the band. And, he's, and it's just like, he's so raw and he's so... Um, and it was it was basically a documentary about his recovery. And um, I look at that, and, and I looked at it at the time when, when I was doing my documentary. And for Metallica, you know, that came, that went, and uh, it was sort of back to the business of being Metallica. And mm -hmm. um, and and James Hetfield didn't go on to write on write songs about making amends or, or working right. the twelve steps of recovery. It was just sort of like he put that out there, and it didn't kind of define him. It just sort of like put it out there, and he moved on. And, and that guy really, I really held on tightly to the idea of that and sort of let, letting that kind of be my model for how to, to, to view that documentary and how to approach it. Because I remember meeting James Hetfield at a, uh, at a Metallica <laughs> concert right when I got my nine month sobriety chip. And of course, like the, the chips that we get in, in sobriety up until a year, they're 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 made out of plastic, right. and then when you get when you, when you get your first year, it's a it's a coin, and so I met James Hetfield backstage at the Metallica concert, and I asked him, I said, Hey man, how long have you been sober? And he said, Seven years. It was at that time, and I mean it was just it was evident. It was written all over his face. You could just see like the health, the 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 happiness. Like it was just like to me, he was just the most like shining example of like meaningful recovery. He said seven years, and I said, "Oh man, cool." And I pulled out my my nine month chip, and I said, "I just got my nine month chip," and I held it up to him, and I said, "No more plastic for me, man. Straight heavy metal from here on out." <laughs> you know, <laughs> meaning that it was my intention yeah, yeah, to really. Yeah. Like protect my sobriety and and uh, and stay in sort of the business of getting year coins and not going back to picking up plastic chips, and uh, you know, boy, that that guy was just such a such a uh, you know. I just have so much respect for him and uh, and just how like he's done it, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, I just like uh, I mean, I, I don't know him personally, and I, and I haven't heard anything about, but just for the way that he that uh what i do know about how he approached it you know i just think that he's really st stayed with it and, and stayed true to it and, and he remains someone who uh who, who i respect and, and look up to you know? yeah it's an it's that's an amazing story you know it's an amazing story and but but back to uh you know final days for you right you know when this is when all this insanity is going on and you're firing off emails every 20 minutes to everybody right. in hollywood telling oh my them God. what you're gonna do that's and you're gonna ride your motorcycle through your apartment and out right. the window. Right, and, and, and there, there's the living room had a sliding glass door. I was gonna open the sliding glass door and, and put a ramp in the living room. I wanted to ride a motorcycle, I'd jump it off the ramp and uh, out the sliding glass door, which would, which would launch me out and I wanted to land on the roof of the building next door, which mm -hmm. was very doable. Knoxville looked at it and he said, <laughs> Knoxville looked at it and said, oh, there, there's not much of a gap right there. Like, it actually made fun of me for that being like, right. like, uh, like super, a, super easy. <laughs> 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 but, but, what, but then in my bedroom, there was a window and, uh, and out, out that window is, you know, some 25 feet down to the, to the sidewalk below. And, um, and, and, uh, and I was emailing everybody in Hollywood, like uh, with the jackass guys copied, you know, I want you guys to bring me uh, something to land on. I'm going to jump out the window. I've got been evicted and I've got to be out of here by, by tomorrow. So let's start filming a third jackass movie and bring me something to land on, preferably a, a hot tub. For me, I wanted to like, jump into a hot tub because it wasn't a very high jump. You know, a cannonball into a hot tub would have been doable. Um, but but if you can't bring a hot tub, like made at least some cardboard boxes. But no matter what, come bring cameras. And if you don't bring anything, if you don't come, if you don't, uh, you know, like you know, uh, fulfill my 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 request. Uh, you know, if you if you don't like you know do what I say, then I promise you I'm going to jump anyway. And I'm gonna find out how many bones get broken when I splat on the concrete, you know, on the sidewalk, because I'm ready to die and I'm gonna jump. <laughs> and so right. that qualified me for. Uh, right, you're architecting your own uh, intervention. I, I scheduled my own intervention, yeah, and, and, and uh, created the proof to uh, have you I, locked up. I provided the documentation right. to qualify me for California's 5150 law, which states that if somebody is harmful to themselves or others, that they can be locked up in a psychiatric ward against their will. Right. And, uh, so you set up a call time, and you think these guys are going to all come over and film you, and that's where the, they showed they up. Showed and, up yeah, they showed up to lock me up in a psychiatric ward. Yeah, and they they had reached so it's out Knoxville, to Dad. Knoxville, Tremaine, Knoxville, Jeff Tremaine, the director, right. um, Trip Taylor, the executive producer of Jackass. Um, 
Uh, who Dr. else? Drew? Cordell, sound, Cordell Mansfield, the sound guy. Uh, Reg, Rick Reg, Big Reg there. Big Reg was there, but he was just he was just wait. He was he was just. Uh, but he was there to take care. So of So Ted, you're in the you're in the information loop, but you're not. You you weren't able to. Well, come no, out the, he was he was at, they asked him explicitly to be there, yeah. and dad dad uh, in, in a controversial move said no. I refuse yeah. to be at my son's Tr- intervention. Tr- Tremaine called. Uh, Knoxville sent a couple of emails and called. Uh, Dr. Drew uh, was very concerned, said if you don't get Steve off the street within 24 hours, he's probably going to die. And uh, then Knoxville really kind of played the responsibility card, if you want to call it that, and said, shit, if my son was in that situation, I'd be out in a heartbeat. I don't understand what's holding you back. And uh, that was maybe the toughest decision I've ever made. But look, and your we, thinking was what? In my not- thinking was, was that Steve described how, despite the strength of our relationship, uh, I could never talk to him about lifestyle. He would just shut down. And so my rationale, rationale was, <clears throat> these guys are his friends, you know, his workmates. Uh, he looks up to them. They have influence with him. They talk that same street cred language, if you want to call it that. If I'm in the room... <laughs> street cred <laughs> If I'm, in, if I'm in that room, all these guys are going to shrink back against the wall, and it's going to be a pissing match between Steve and me in the center of the room, and I'm going to lose. Yeah, it's going to work I, across if, purposes. If, if I don't go, then these guys are going to have to take responsibility, and Steve will listen to them more than uh, he listened to me. Yeah, that's pretty insightful, actually. They will get the job done, and four days later when he was in the uh, uh, lockup cord. at that was Cedar that's Sinai, what, uh, I flew out and spent a week there. Gotcha. Wow, and and then uh, and 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 um, I, I was in the psych ward for seven days. They extended my stay uh, by t- changing my status from fifty-one to fifty, which is three days, to fifty-two fifty, which is two weeks. And after seven days, I determined that uh, that I really did need help, and that I was willing to go uh, seek help and go into a treatment center. Um, so, Dad. So, uh, what is the? But let's let's park it there for a second. I mean, first of all, I would imagine you're doing the Thorazine shuffle for like a couple of days in there, right? Like trying uh, to like, detox the, all, the, all the, this stuff. Uh, and, well, when I first got showed up, um, they had. Uh, they got me into a, into a car. You know, I mean, the idea of the intervention wasn't a, uh, you know, the, like the kind on TV they say, are you willing to accept help? You know, it wasn't that variation or the, you know, it was, um, it was, you know, they were there to inform me that I was going to get help and I was going to a psych ward. And that if I didn't like that, that they were quite plainly going to beat me up and take me against my will. And so I didn't feel like getting beaten up and I went willingly. <coughs> So we got into, uh, into a, a car, it was an SUV, and I was in, you know, Knoxville and Tremaine were driving me to the hospital. When we got to the hospital, there was a guy waiting at the curb with a, uh, a wheelchair, you know, thinking he was gonna wheel me in. And I got out of the car and, and uh, you know, I looked at the guy, he said, I don't need no, you know, fucking wheelchair, or whatever, and I just, and I spit on the guy, you know? Uh-huh. That was kind of like, a, not unusual for me to spit on people at that time in my life. and. Um, uh, so I walked into the hospital and I th- was just sure that I was going to explain. It was, you know, calmly explained. It was a misunderstanding. I was just, I was very lucid. I was, you know, I was kind of, I had an ability to kind of turn on like, you know, like uh, lucid, s- sensible seeming. Of course, man. Every addict alcoholic knows how to do that when, you know, when the time comes and you got to like show up and like convince people that you're okay. Right. And, and, uh, and I probably would have been able to do that if it weren't for those emails that I provided. Provided, which they had printed out to document why I was uh, why I qualified for California's 5150 law, but um, when, when when I determined that I couldn't, um, when I wasn't able to uh, talk my way out of it, and that I wasn't you know going to be locked up, I became belligerent and threw a temper tantrum and grabbed a chair and went to throw it, and, and as I tried to throw this chair, I got tackled by like hospital orderlies who slammed me down onto a. Uh, like a stretcher, and and and, I, and they jam the needle in my butt cheek, which I understand right. to be Thorazine. Yeah, and then you're out, lights yeah. out. Yeah, yeah. They put a needle in my butt cheek, and I took a nap. That was as simple as that. And um, now, when I woke up, um, you know, then there I am. Now I'm introduced to the to the psych ward. You know, where the doors don't open. Um, I, I was like really clear about um, about. Uh, I know what they want to hear. You know, I know what they want me to say. 
they want me to say I'm gonna, I'm gonna like, you know, stop doing drugs and, you know, get sober. Like, uh, I was kind of negotiating, like, uh, in my head for the first few days in there, thinking, yeah, it probably really is a pretty good idea for me to quit doing ketamine, you know, like, right. like uh, this special K is really just not good for me, and, and I don't uh, do myself any favors when I'm on it, and, you know, like, I don't know if I can, but I probably should think about stopping doing coke, you know, but, but then, like, that, but then, like, just, no, I can't, but, but when, when I got down, like, I, I, I gotta be able to, maybe drinking, I could think about it, but oh, I don't know, man, I'm gonna quit drinking, you know? But when it got to weed, it was like, no, I will not, <laughs> you know? So it was kind of like I was figuring out in my own mind, but maybe I'll tell them what they wanna hear, but what I'll really do is this and that. And just over the course of those seven days that I was in there, um, you know, a number of things happened with people coming in to talk about sobriety, and, and somebody gave me a book about sobriety, and. Um, Ultimately, it was like, wow, okay, you know, like once uh, I'd heard the people tell their stories and, and, uh, and kind of read in this book and, and then taking the 20 questions of Alcoholics Anonymous, which they gave me. <laughs> yeah, um, well, I'm sure you're a perfect score on that. Oh, dude, I aced it. Yeah, of course. I totally aced it, except for like the, I could probably, I think that in hindsight, I could have, I could have argued uh, that some questions were were not applicable to me. <laughs> you know? So, but it's not like the the clouds parted and you know the angels were singing and you were blessed with this like moment of willingness. It, and it yeah. wasn't like that, but it also kind of was something clicked. And this, there's a distinct something clicked because I, uh, I I you know I gave up on on the whole I, I'm going to continue to smoke weed thing when I made the decision. You know when I made the decision seven days into the psychiatric ward said, I'm gonna go to rehab and I'm gonna learn how to live clean and sober, I meant 100% clean and sober. Mm -hmm. I, I gave up any idea that I was gonna to continue to smoke weed, that I was gonna to continue to drink. And, that, and that, that, that arriving at that decision, what do you think that's a function of? Like what was going on that oh, got you to man. that point? I mean, it's like you've been in rehab before, you know, when you went in, you weren't exactly, it's not like you right. didn't been, know you were an alcoholic. It was, it was 13 so. years prior, my, my one mm -hmm. experience in, in rehab. And uh, you know what, what, what it was, what, what helped me to get to that was, I would say, primarily humiliation. You know, like I, I, I uh, my reality was that I could not get through any given day without performing some uh, dreadful thing <laughs> that just uh -huh. brought about, like, frankly, humiliation, you know, um, or, or just guilt and shame and remorse. Like, when, uh, you know, I would, like, in the moment of, uh, of, of my bender, of, you know, on my whatever drug I was on and sitting at the computer firing off emails, like, in the moment of sending every email, I thought it was just pure genius. I thought I was, like, just, oh, this is great, I'm amazing, like, or this, is, this isn't this is wrong, this is justified, or, you right. know, whatever. And, the, and then it's like to, to wake up the next day and, and uh, realize what I had done. Um, God, it was just humiliating, you know, right. and um, and there was so much of that going on, and it was like a daily on a daily basis. I was just humiliating myself. Well, the more humiliated you are, the more you got to use. Right, so. it's a cycle, absolutely, yeah. for sure, it's a cycle, and like, and it was just uh, that's what I think, like, really, for the, that and just how sick I was, you know, like. Um, I, I just, the seven days in the psych ward and, and the experience that I had in there with the various people that came in to talk to me, um, like, and the humiliation and, you know, all of the shame and remorse, it was sort of a perfect storm of, uh, you know, that came with the clarity that I needed help. Right. I mean, the, the trajectory, the arc has been pretty amazing. I mean, it would have been one thing for you to, okay, steve sober and then just live your life, but I've seen you know, just from my outside perspective, looking in on your life, and I don't know it that intimately, but you know, you really grabbed onto this thing. I mean, you did the rehab super hard. Where did you go to Impact or someplace like that? No, it wasn't that. I went. I bounced around. I went to the Gooden Center in Pasadena. Uh -huh. It's not like a, I started out at Los Encinas. Is that, is that Drew? Oh, Drew. No, Los Encinas yeah. is Drew's place. Los Encinas right? was yeah. Drew. He's long since washed his hand of that place. Uh -huh. But um, but yeah, and I showed up like when I when I got there, I was so serious about it. And, and uh, Dr. Drew was the chemical dependency or the director of the chemical dependency unit of the hospital. And I remember, and I was with Dad. Um, I, I said to uh, to Dr. Drew, I said, however long you recommend that I stay in here in this rehab, I want to go ahead and stay significantly longer 
because I, I was clear on, on uh, having heard all the statistics about like 95% of alcoholics dying drunk of causes related to alcoholism. Mm-hmm. And the, you know, the staggering statistics of, uh, of how uh, it's not, um, you know, the odds are stacked against us, you know? Like they, they, they'll say like, look around you in the rehab, 12 of you, and one, only one of you is going to make it, or this mm-hmm. and that. I knew that the odds weren't on in my favor. So how I, long did you stay in that rehab? He said that what Dr. Drew said was, I recommend. I don't recommend you stay more than 30 days here in, in Los Encinas, which is, thank God, because I think that 30 days was pushed 100 uh-huh. grand or something. Like, or whatever, <laughs> whatever, whatever right. it was, it was, it was obscene. And... Um, and uh, and he said, but if but if you really are this serious about your sobriety, then what I'm going to recommend is that you go from 30 days in here and you move into a, into a sober living, like yeah. a halfway house. And, uh, and he was there for two years. Right, right? I stayed in sober living yeah, until I had a two years. Crazy long time. Where where was that sober living house? That, well, I bounced around. What happened was, uh, you know, so I was in rehab for the 30 days, and and I wasn't committed to what the next move was, you know, but but, but I was I was just very willing to do whatever I could to give myself better odds, you know, to give myself an advantage. And, um, you know, invariably on any given day in, uh, in the rehab at Las Encinas there, one of the other, uh, patients was always just, uh, you know, antsy, like, I gotta get out of here. I gotta get out of here. I gotta get my kids. I gotta get back to my kids. I gotta get back to my job. I gotta go do this. I gotta do that. And the counselors would look at them and just sort of, uh, you know, very matter of factly say, Hey, I get it. You know, but what you're talking about is getting loaded. Mm-hmm. You know, they said, if you make any, uh, if you make anything your priority other than, uh, your sobriety, then, then, uh, you're going to lose it and you're going to lose your sobriety unless you make your sobriety your only priority. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and faith for me at that time was like pretty simple. It was just like, I had my faith in those counselors having do- devoted their lives to, to a constant stream of new people coming in and, and, uh, and, and, and going out, you know, and just the turnover every day, you know, like it's this stream of, of, uh, of addicts coming through that they would have figured out, you know, after years of that, what does and doesn't work. And when they so plainly and matter of factly say, you're going to get loaded if you do that, I believed them. And so I just sort of, you know, did what they said. Uh, you know, I, I got the sponsor. I did all those things that, that are, uh, that are recommended. Um, and, uh, and, and in the process of working with the sponsor and looking at, you know, like all the stuff we look at the inventory and all that. Like I just, you know, I had got the fourth step blues and wound up, mm-hmm. you know, in in psych ward number two. Never got loaded, but uh, but I had depression. I, I yeah, that self loathing that it talks about right. in uh, in that fourth chapter. You, <laughs> you know? can't linger on the four on four too long. You know, you got to uh, get dude, through five. <laughs> you I'm, get rid of that stuff. I'm morb- yeah. I'm morbidly morbidly put myself on trial with that uh with that number you get, four. You, so you like clinically diagnosed depressed they i mean they what, diagnosed me work? as bipolar they you uh-huh. know they, they prescribed me like they'd make fun of me in rehab they'd call me medicine boy uh-huh the way so, you told it at the time uh, you realized that your computer was becoming part of the problem because it communicate let you communicate to the outside world and you're trying to prove to everybody you know the right way to go through all this oh, I, was, I was the worst oh, and, yeah, I was the worst. and so you you gave it up uh, voluntarily and I always understood that it was driven by your obsession with the computer that had ramifications beyond that but when your sponsor took away the computer for a week well, I asked him to take away my computer yeah. And, and, and not for a week, for, for months on end. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, one thing about Steve, I've <clears throat> said before, the world is full of stupid people that try to make like they're intelligent and they fall on their ass. Uh, Steve is a very, very smart guy that's making a good living out of pretending that he's stupid. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, <laughs> and there one, it is and, in a nutshell. <laughs> and, 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 and one of the things, we had this discussion just the other night, <clears throat> Steve has a very sharply defined comfort zone. Most people kind of go from white, and between white and black, there's progressively more gray as they become less motivated and less proficient, but they're still functioning. Steve, within his comfort zone, within that white area, is second to none. I mean, he's committed, he works his ass off, he's very smart, he gets 11 out of 10. 
but stepped three inches over that comfort line, and he's as useless as tits in a bowl. <laughs> he just. He I mean, just, when did you when did you come into that awareness? I mean, you're a traditional guy, like you know, <laughs> like conservative. Tits like on a bowl. When, when <laughs> Steve's a little kid, when do you start thinking, what am I going to do with this guy? Like, where you know, where am I going to put like? You know, you're sending him to good schools and you're thinking, you're probably thinking I'm going to, you know, raise him to, you know, be my shadow or I don't know what you were thinking. But at some point you had to realize, like, I got a square peg. I'm trying to jam into a round hole here. Well, there was a moment uh, and I guess you were it was pre jackass, but not by much. I grew up in a family that was principally academics. My dad was a Ph.D. in history. My mother was an M.A. in English. Uh, I've, my brother's a PhD, my sister's an MA, uh, I've got a, uh, a niece who's a director at the Courthold Art Industry in uh, our, our uh, facility in central London with a PhD in art history, and I'm the only one of the family that went into business. And I wasn't ashamed of it, but I kind of thought of myself a little bit as a black sheep growing up in this family mm-hmm. of academics. And at a point in time, I guess I was either about to finish or just finished my uh, undergraduate at college. I never went beyond that. I just got the bachelor degree. Uh, My dad pulled me aside and said, you know, I really don't care what you do. I mean, don't have any hang-ups. Do whatever you want to do. Just make sure you do it as well as you possibly can. And you do something that you're enjoying while you're doing it as Mm -hmm. well as you possibly can. And that kind of resonated. It took a while for me to bring Steve into that tent. But we had a a moment of reckoning where we had that conversation. It It was October of 1998. And Dad uh, pulled me aside and he said, Son, uh, I have to to acknowledge I have done a disservice to you by not supporting you in this career path that you've clearly committed yourself to. (laughs) (laughs) What career path is that, though? It's like... how do you take a kid? I'm like, I'm, I'm interested in what Steve was like at 12, 15, and you're trying to parent this guy who's like, you know, a, a wild stallion that you're probably trying to break him in, right? Like, how does that work? Well, I, I'm not sure, but I'll give you, you know, sort of an example. He said this before, and it's been, it's in his book. But I guess he was uh, 12 or 13. Uh, we were living in Toronto, and the Motley crew were coming to town. At the time, the Motley Crue. <laughs> at so the time, great. at the time, I was <laughs> head of the uh, uh, Nabisco Canada uh, operations, and we had skyboxes. We had, in Maple we Leaf had several skyboxes oh, wow. in the uh, Maple Leaf Gardens, which was the arena at the time. And uh, there was certainly nobody in the executive ranks of uh, uh, Nabisco Canada that were going to go to the Motley Crue. <laughs> so I thought I was going to be a pretty good dad. And I came home and I said, Steve, guess what? I've got us the skybox. Because I was a Motley Crew fanatic. Yeah. I love them so much. I said, I got us the skybox for the Motley Crew, and even better, I set it up so that our company chauffeur is going to bring your recording equipment into the box so that you can record the show while we're there. And I thought, son of a bitch, I really got an yeah, 11 like out of 10. Dad of the year. And Steve looked at me. And he said, Dad, that's lame. <laughs> I said, watching, my, watching Motley Crue through a plate glass window sucks. <laughs> so then, so then I, I had to improvise, and I said, I'll tell you what. You, know, you get better tickets, and I'll go with you to the gardens, and we'll sit in your seats. Mm-hmm. And he took the challenge, and this was unbelievable. One well, Sunday, I, one I, Sunday I, afternoon, yeah, let me finish. Right. One Sunday afternoon, uh, he spent four hours going through the then paper yellow pages of the Toronto phone book, calling every hotel in the city, asking by name for the manager of the Motley crew. And after about three and a half hours, he caught up not with the manager, but with the manager's brother, who was so impressed with Steve's initiative, he said, I'll tell you what, you got six row uh, front seats and backstage passes. So he met the challenge. He got better tickets than I did. And we went with his tickets. And he went and met the crew afterwards. And then the thing was really astonishing. I was just blown away by that. And from then on, um, it, it was a real curse because when every shitty report card came in, Dad said, "Son, if you could just apply right. the the motivation, so the tenacity, yeah, he, the 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 initiative, 
They get, they get, they get applied to meeting Molly Crew. He said, if you get straight A's, your life would be great. Yeah. And, and you know what? But what he said, and it, it took a while for him to say it, like years, not weeks or months. And it really resonated with me. He said, you know, I really, every time you said that, I really took it as a put down, because the way I interpreted it, Steve talking is that you're saying, Dad, that I peaked out at age 14, and everything that after that is going to be a failure. And that really got me thinking. I mean, right, so I, I clearly remember, industrious. Putting... When you get your mind set on something, like you can right. channel that energy, but it's like, what are you going to... Right. Like, there is no career path for what... I mean, you could have never there foreseen. No There's there, there no, like, no path. Yeah, like, what is it? Where do I take this? Well, I'll, t- I'll, 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 I'll tell you where it went, and, 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 and this progresses the story. Uh, he decided he wanted to be a stuntman. And this was the job title. Th- this is so great because this was uh, like when I was dropping out of, out of the University of Miami. Mm-hmm. It was 1993. I was still, still on this. I'm going to be a stuntman. I'm going to be a stuntman. So 1994, 1995, I'm like, uh, like accumulating home video footage of, of like, like genuinely pretty reckless, crazy stunts for which I would uh, ultimately... You know, like get get some traction. Dad was busy going well, to the going finish. to the local yeah, let me, library. Let me, let me pick it up. There, there, there's a, uh, I'm, not, an, uh, I'm not sure if there's a library or an archive of cinematography just off Russell Square in central London in the edge of Soho. And I thought, you know, I've heard and read that stuntmen are going to be made obsolete by digital technology. I'm going to go there, and we, my wife and I, spent probably three hours in this place. You know, going through all the records about digital technology and the evolution of uh, compiling an stunts. argument to shut me down. And, <laughs> and, and uh, in those days, obviously, there was no internet. And uh, you know, if we paid uh, the equivalent of twenty-five cents a page or something, we got paper copies. And so I w- got copies of the uh, uh, all these articles and uh, stuck them in the mail, the snail mail, to get them to Steve. And eventually, they got there. And about a week later, I said. You know, have they arrived? Have they arrived? Yes, they've arrived. And I said, wow, that's terrific, isn't it? So and now said, you can give up this stupid right, stunt so, It's the logic here. It's the so, logic, and, right? And Your so logical his, argument. And, and so his that. answer is even more logical. He says, fine. If there aren't going to be any stunt mans in the movie, so be it. I'm going to get a bunch of crazy guys like me, and we're going to put together a stunt circus and tour the country. Uh-huh. And that's what Jackass was all that's about. That's basically what happened. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, mean, how do you first meet, uh, you know, the crew? Like, how do you meet Knoxville and it Bam was, and all uh, those guys? There was a skateboarding magazine that brought us all together. Um, it was uh, a, a skateboard magazine that was kind of thinly veiled. It was mostly just sort of uh, for the purpose of being kind of naughty and, and crazy and mm-hmm. offensive. Um, and they made these videos. And um, you know, I was a fan of the magazine. I'd be, I, I kind of worked my way into their good graces, and you know, did stunts and crazy stuff uh, in their magazines and videos. And ultimately, the guy in charge uh, reached out to Spike Jones. He was friends. He also said, from the skate, from the skate right, world. Right. Uh-huh. He said, "Hey, uh, Spike, you know, um, our Big Brother. That's what it was called, Big Brother Magazine. And the Big Brother videos. He said were so popular." They've really like you know gone crazy with popularity, but I get the sense that that they're not at all popular because of the skateboarding. And he says nobody really cares about the skateboarding. It's all this other nonsense going on in the videos that's uh, that's really uh, <laughs> catching fire. And um, he said I think that if we uh, were to subtract the skateboarding from the videos, then what's left over could be a great TV show. Mm-hmm. And I don't think anybody else could have really done that. Um, uh, with any kind of, kind of hope for success, because um, it was just such such lunacy. It was just such like really crazy nonsense. I think anybody else would have, uh, you know, come to MTV or wherever they went, and and they just would have said, "We can't right. put this fucking shit like, on TV. We like, can't we can't put this on TV." But the thing was that it was Spike Jones like uh, presenting right. the thing, so it's like, wow, Oscar-nominated Hollywood movie d- director Spike Jones has this crazy thing, like, okay, now I can work. And I think that Spike really, you know, I don't want to uh, give him all the credit, but I think that he really... Um, by believing in you and, and putting his, like, stamp of right, approval on Right, by putting his stamp on I think that he got, uh, he got corporate America to take seriously what they, you know, arguably shouldn't have. You know? <laughs> yeah, but you, you, you're oversimplifying. You're, you're taking a very linear look at how you hooked up with uh, Tremaine 
And the reality was, in those days, you were going shotgun. You were sending VC- oh, yeah, VCRs. Sure. In fact, I, you have kidded Steve. There were months when his Federal Express bill was larger than his income. Uh-huh. And uh, sure. he, he was shotgunning these things out. And, and I was, I, I had, so I that had, Motley uh, Crew energy, the ticket, uh, well, did, it's the same thing. Yeah, as but you know, totally. I had the, the, the two VCRs connected like in my sister's living room. Taping the tapes. Just tape to tape, tape to tape. Uh-huh. It was like a fucking assembly line. And I had like, and then I wrote uh, on the little sticker on the, the, the came in the blank, the cassette tape. The, the sticker for the spine of the VHS tape, and then I would write, Stevo, stunts and party tricks. <laughs> <laughs> like, who wouldn't want to watch stunts and party <laughs> yeah, tricks? <I> know. <laughs> and, and, and then I would like, Like, you know, what kind of people are you mailing this off to? to like, largely people in the skateboarding industry, but generally, like, anybody who uh, I thought might watch it. Like, even, like, like uh, and talent agents that I would dig up online, like... Mm-hmm. Um, I would, I'd send, I'd send that shit everywhere. And so but, is that how you connected with Knoxville or how, how did that come together? Um, the, uh, I don't think I, I had sent tapes to, to Big Brother. I was just a fan of Big Brother. And when Big Brother came through uh, my town, which at the time was Albuquerque, New Mexico, um, I just made it my mission to track them down and, and uh, inform them that they were going to publish an article about me because right. I was just so gnarly. Uh-huh. Again, the Motley Crue story. When he's committed, and I made there's it no happen. stopping. I got yeah. my damn article. <laughs> yeah. But the, the interesting thing we've debated since then is was it easier when Steve broke in or more difficult than today? Because he was recording all this stuff on his home video camera and going reel to reel to make the VCRs and sending VCRs by VHS FedEx tapes, or VHS. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There, there, there was no, uh, you know, internet as we know it today, no uploading, right. downloading it was, capability. It was snail mail. So he had to really work his ass off, you know, to get this stuff out. But he was doing it without very much competition. Mm-hmm. You know, very few people would have his energy and commitment to make that happen. Yeah, now in, everybody in has world, distribution. In today's world, any, anybody can distribute anything right. instantly. And so the, uh, you know, it is easier to uh, gain access, but it's got to be so much more competitive. There's, there's more people doing it. With more people doing it. Yeah. And I think the argument could be made that Steve got a, a big boost by the low technology as compared with today's higher technology. Yeah, that's interesting. I think I did better when doing it at the time when I did because I was sort of, uh, like, the, my medium uh, was such, like, I would, I, I wouldn't really film a lot of heads and tails. It was just I wanted the shot of me flying off the roof of the building, you know? And the difference so, like, is that now, if you were doing it now, you just have a YouTube channel and you'd be blowing up your YouTube channel and that's all right. you'd need. It would, it would, you'd, you're like, I'm well, going to get a million subscribers and then, you know, yeah, go yeah, from but, there. But, but the point is anybody can do that now. Right. When he did it, it required a lot of initiative, a lot of effort, uh, a lot of, you know, stress, if you will. I mean, you know, putting out, the small amounts that he earned, whatever odd jobs he had, buying all these... <laughs> whatever <laughs> drugs he sold. <laughs> <laughs> that's an odd job. Actually, that's a, but that's no, a I, career. I, <laughs> but, I, it, I mean, as long as Steve is within his, th- his, his clearly defined circle, there is absolutely no stopping him. Uh-huh. Well, that's Not, what Dad, Dad put it another way one time, which I thought was even more eloquent. Uh, he said, um, how did he say it? He said, uh, when... when when Steve sets his mind to it, uh, he can accomplish just about anything. The problem is that's a fairly, fairly narrow slice of the pie <laughs> of, what, of what I set my mind right. to. Well, I would, have, I would have presumed that you would have been a dad who would be thinking, like, my son's out of control. I just hope one day he's going to wake up and grow up and then, you know, kind of come and join the fold, like, and get a real job and, like, be an adult. But what I'm hearing and what I'm getting is that you really were supportive of him trying to figure out what he wanted to do and pursue his dream. Well, at a, at a to point. a degree, yeah. Like, I, I was flailing around. I wasn't, you know, getting any traction whatsoever in my pursuit of a career as a stuntman. But uh, at a certain point, you know, when I moved to Albuquerque and I moved in with my sister there and I had on my sister's floor the VCRs and I was this and that. Um, and I was, I was uh, you know, back in school. Um, my sister found out about Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Clown College, and and uh, she came home with that information. You know that it was free to get into if you could get in, 
super exclusive, uh, but if you could get into it, it's free. And she, I think, probably thought, like, you know, this would be great for my brother. Like, I was like, I could get him the fuck out of my house. You know? <laughs> um, but, uh, but, yeah, when I heard about that, I thought, wow, you know, um, if, uh, if, I, if I had that circus, uh, the affiliation with Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Billy Circus, and I was a trained professional, you know, and this, then people would take me more seriously with uh, all my idiotic, you know, sort of light myself on fire at the keg party, you know, stunts. And... Um, and so I, I made it my mission to get into clown college, and I did. I, you know, I pulled that off. And um, when I went to clown college, it was like a big deal. And that was where, where like, shit started kind of, I guess, like, my, my antics were really showing some signs of professionalism, like, leading up to that point, and particularly from that point on. And um, my mom... I uh, came to my uh, my clown college graduation, the gala ceremony, you know, like there was a really major big deal and dad was conspicuously absent. This was uh, in September of 1997 when, uh, when that happened. And um, again, the talk that dad and I had was in October of 1998. So dad hadn't fully come around yet and, mm -hmm. and dad was like, like pretty like uh, dead set against like you know the idea of supporting clown college <laughs> you know? dad couldn't wrap his head around that and and uh and 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 what like no that's not true okay the the remember uh you know i mean perhaps dad was in england at the time no I, well maybe i can't remember remember mom and i you know were divorced it hadn't been totally amicable and i remember thinking at the time that this could kind of be her deal and that it might not be quite as sympathetic. Of course, my mom showed up drunker than shit. Right. You know, just, <laughs> but but it was more in in my mind. It was more, uh, you know, kind of a voluntary sharing. Uh, all right, because from, from because, because, because before we had our conversation about the uh, I'll, I'll support you and all the rest of it. I was certainly in your camp when you were interviewing for the job on the uh, cruise lines. Well, right, but that. Uh, um, that way, I wasn't on the cruise lines until 1999. Yeah, but that, but it was wasn't that before. It was, a, that was after our, our conversation was, after, was 1998. And when when I did, remember specifically what, 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 because mom had mom was you know the chronic alcoholic and mm -hmm. she had she suffered an aneurysm, which brought like a, you know us sort of family members from uh, wherever we were, my sister and I in Albuquerque, dad flew over from England, and we all sort of convened, like, uh, you know, on, over this crisis with my mom, and she survived the aneurysm, but in, you know, with terrible, uh, you know, terrible... Uh, handicap. Handicap, yeah, mm -hmm. but physical and mental, and, and she was just in terrible shape for oh, the wow. last five years, but it was, it was in the midst of this crisis, and, and it was actually at the hospital where they had mom um, in the ICU, and um, and dad, you know, you're like, right. Yeah, I remember that now. It was it was it was it was outside. It was actually not outside the hospital. We took a, you know, we were in the hospital with for, for mom, and we went to like some like pub slash restaurant, like a kind of English pub type place, and it was it was a. Uh, I, I want to say, like, even, like, we went outside. Like, I think I went outside to smoke a cigarette or something, and Dad followed me out and sort of sprung on me this uh, th really thoughtful conversation, uh, which is why I know it was October of 1998. And when... when and, um, I remember chasing around Coral Gables, uh, trying to buy you the uh, long material, like, for your, your, st your stilts. Oh, the, the, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, that was way later. That was that way later. later. Okay. Way later. That was once I had the, the plan to do the film for the pilot for MTV. Oh, okay. Um, but uh, the thing was, was so great is that when Dad um, pledged his support for me in, in this... And you're right, it's so funny to call it a path because there was no path. Yeah, like, how <laughs> do you even... There's no, like, where are you going to take this? Right, there was, no, there was no path. But, but Dad was, you know, like, okay, so you're going to do this. You're committed and I support you. And I remember... Um, like sh very shortly after that, you know, like um, seeing a uh, a commercial on TV for for this show that they had at the time, which was called Real TV. Now at that time, there was enough, uh, there were enough home video cameras to sustain America's Funniest Home Videos, mm -hmm. like uh, and uh, you know, and it, but now like the video camera was becoming kind of a more commonplace household it item. Was still, you know, reality TV was slowly right. oh, beginning. I mean, the TV real world was, had been going on for a while, but there was per, other perhaps, stuff. Perhaps, yeah. But but what this commercial said was. 
do you have any home video that that you think that we that we uh, should see, or that, that we might? If you have any home video that you think we might want to see, send it in to Real TV, and they just uh -huh. did, you know it was just this hodgepodge of like crazy like hot on camera home video stuff, and and I, and 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 you know like. I was just feeling kind of gung ho, and I think Dad like like put some wind in my sails in that regard. And I called up their number and I said, "I don't have video that you might want to see. I have footage that you need desperately. <laughs> you bad. You need badly. You're hurting for what I have. Uh -huh. You know." And uh, and I sent in um, I sent in the vi the video that I had. Uh, you know, like a, a, a compilation of all my stuff. And they came back with, "Oh, we want, we like the video of you uh, lighting yourself on fire on the roof of, uh, <laughs> on the roof of this building and doing this simultaneous fire breathing front flip off of the roof into the pool below." And I remember thinking, "Is that all they want? Is that all out of out of the wealth of footage uh -huh. that that's all they're interested in?" And and uh, they had, there was some ancillary footage that went with it, and like me jumping off the building during the daytime. Um, but uh, they were offering me. If I recall correctly, five and I do, I know it was. They offered me five hundred dollars for exclusive rights to that video, mm -hmm. and I remember then I said to the guy on the phone because I wasn't familiar with the term exclusive. I said, "What's that?" He said, "Oh, well, that means that, that you don't own that we own it outright entirely, and that you don't own it anymore." And I'm like, "Wait a second. So like, I don't, I don't own it anymore." He's like, "Well, yeah, you can't do anything more with it. Like, uh, it's all ours." And I freaked out. And I remember, like, I hung up the phone with that guy, and I called Dad. And I said, "Dad, ah, they want, you know, I called this way. They want, they, they, you know, they're like uh, exclusive. They want to take all my rights." And and Dad just said, "Son," he said, "Calm down." He says, "Calm down. Take a deep breath. This isn't complicated." He said, "He said, figure out for yourself. Figure out what, at, which, at which point is it a deal breaker." And uh, and then draw a line in the sand and stick to it. He said, "From what you're telling me, it sounds like exclusivity is a deal breaker." And uh, he says, if, "If I were you, I would say I'd call them back and say, hey, you know, exclusive does not work for me. You can have the non-exclusive, and uh, and you have to give me a thousand bucks, not five hundred. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that's what I did, and that's what I got. Oh, and they gave it to you. <laughs> yeah, well, I nice. got. I, they 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 took a non exclusive. Non -exclusive. They paid me a thousand bucks, and um, and that was like the first thing Dad and I like collaborated on, like right. in a meaningful way. And then from that point, like truly, and 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 really, really, like you know, this means a lot to me to say this. That um. It means a lot to me to say that, that dad didn't by any means jump on a bandwagon where he wasn't supportive and then all of a sudden I had some success and then he came around afterwards. No, like very much the, uh, the opposite way around. I could say that I became successful because I had dad's support. You know, I think yeah. that that was like, I mean, I probably would have figured some stuff out on my, on my own anyway, but, 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 but dad really put wind in my sails. And That's it, great. It really put wind in my sails. And then when, when the first business like uh, conversations came up, like the real TV one. Dad was in the conversation with me, and um, and that's just it's it's such a big such a big deal. Um, that's like, like 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 well, and, and it, it, it came to be that my that my career in in uh, in in I guess capturing and and uh, you know I guess uh, you know selling like the video, which is what it was. Um, it became for us like a an activity like that we bonded over, yeah, like could, very yeah. much like like throwing the football. You got this businessman here; he knows right. a lot about business. You need some advice about that. Yeah, we used to bond over like throwing. When I was a kid, like after my, my grades were shitty, like I was in trouble for this, I was in trouble for that, and like we just wouldn't talk about it. We wouldn't talk about my report cards. We'd just go outside, we'd throw the fucking football. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'd, I'd run the pattern. Dad would call and he'd throw it to me, and we'd have a great time. And we bonded like that, like we bonded over. over yeah, uh, yeah, yeah you're, I think you're missing a link because. Uh, on, on, <laughs> no, it's great how how like your memories are different. Right. You know what uh -huh, I mean? Like you're sure. remembering like my dad didn't show up at the right. like, clown college thing, and you probably uh -huh. have some resentment about well, that. Not enough, and he's having a totally different recollection. I don't think I, I don't think I resent that. him because I just get it. It just wasn't his thing. He just, uh -huh. Like at the before the before the point where we had that conversation in 1998, where he pledged to support me. Like I'm not resentful, or, or, or I just understand. Like I was, he just. It just wasn't as he couldn't wrap his head around. Where, 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 where I got, um, you know, more actively involved <clears throat> and committed, I forgot real TV, but yeah, that was it. I have no legal training, 
but much of my career was with companies where I spent a lot of time with company lawyers. And I became very, very comfortable uh, with contract law and uh, could read a contract. And I always believed that law is 80, 85% common sense, and you don't need the lawyers involved until you get past that 80% threshold. And so I would read the contracts that he got, and they were brutal. I mean, I, his first contract, I'm, I'm jumping ahead uh, chronologically, but the first contract he got for Jackass, uh, the MTV contract. Well, MTV is notorious for horrible. Well, but, 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 the, but the point is they were going to prevent him from doing anything other than film Jackass shows. And I saw that in the heartbeat, and I said, Steve, you're not going to sign that. And for him, they took it out. Uh, I forget what the issues were with real TV. The exclusivity thing always kept coming up. But I could go through, and, and he would... Uh, and representation deals are even worse, because, mm -hmm. because oh, then, they're they're, then, then, they're, then once you sign up, then they're going to take uh, a percentage of everything mm -hmm. that you ever make, and, and uh, it's going to renew automatically, and, and if they just do that with like a, a hundred people, and then they get one person that takes off, right. then... So in, in, in those days, obviously, he didn't have the means or the stature to uh, have a lot of outside help. And so I fulfilled that role. And by working through the deals and making suggestions in the contracts, I became much more involved in the content of what he was working mm -hmm. on. And then we could start kicking around ideas. And uh, I had one idea. It still hasn't been filmed. He liked it at the time. Well, the executive dump? The executive dump. <laughs> <laughs> now, ben, ben says he wants me to dress up as a businessman. Let me tell the story. All right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, picture this tree-lined suburban street in upper middle America. And uh, Mr. Junior Executive <laughs> is walking down to the uh, bus underground carpool, whatever you have it, uh, carrying his attache case. And at a point in time, he stops, puts the attache case down, pulls out a copy of the Wall Street Journal, drops his pants, squats down. While he's taking, reading the Wall Street Journal, takes a shit, calmly wipes his ass with toilet paper out of the attache case, puts the Wall Street Journal back in the bag, pulls up his pants, and walks off to do his daily job. Uh -huh. uh, I, I thought that might be kind of. Nice. I think it'd be good, but like I don't know if Steve is the right guy to do it because <laughs> no, no one's going to buy the buy well, him well, in well, a suit well, with well, an attaché well, yeah, case. First of all, at that stage, he wasn't well enough known for that to be an issue. Right. But secondly, the mere fact of Steve in a business suit, even before he was recognized, has humor in its own right. right. Because it's so clearly inconsistent. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I you got a production me. company here. You got like <laughs> business <laughs> affairs <laughs> and your like development exact. Right. Well, I, I remember you. I remember it as you telling me to take a dump into the suitcase. Or into the attaché case. And then close it I, was up. That, was that, I couldn't remember. I maybe, maybe, maybe that was, that's that, was actually better. that was like yeah. three and yeah, a half after take, dogs. Yeah, okay. take, take it down into it and then that's wipe better, it. Yeah, wipe, yeah, wipe, yeah. Wipe Whether that's my <laughs> idea or yours, it would make a better storyline. No question. Why so, not? Ted, where, where does, where does like, Steve's like, insatiable need for attention come from? I believe it's because he changed schools every two, two and a half years. And uh, in five cases, it was changing countries uh, along with the school. And uh, he always was kind of hyperactive and not highly motivated to schoolwork. But with all this constant moving, he was always a new kid. And he decided that his way to get recognized and accepted was to be the cut up. Mm -hmm. And uh, that kind of developed the persona. I mean, you told the story about how you banged your nose or something and wanted to get out of class. That's when I ripped the tooth out. <laughs> okay. yeah. Oh, that's the story you told on Marin, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh -huh. getting out of class. But, I mean, would you agree with that, Steve? I think that, that I mean, I believe, like, in my, in my heart that if I stayed in one place, I'd probably be, you know, without all the moving, I think I'd be an attention whore as well. Uh, I think you'd be much less so. And in fact, you might have Perhaps. been. You probably wouldn't have been successful, because you would have had sufficiently less motivation that you wouldn't have put your heart and soul into it the way you did. Perhaps you know. And I think a case study will be my niece. I've got a, a niece yeah. who, uh, who I think manifests a lot of uh, 
you know, of, of whatever's going on with me, I think is, is going on with her, except she's lived in the same place for a whole life. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, it's like an experiment. Do you, do you think but, that there's a, that Cassie and I are similar? No. No? She it's loves not. reading. She prides herself in getting A's. She's a little bit uncomfortable <laughs> with the odd B. <laughs> I mean, I would agree that because of the uh, family genes, there is a, a, a propensity for addiction. I uh, agree with what you call the more monster. I think that, that, but, I think but, that she's, but, uh, she's got that look at me, look at me thing going yeah, on. Yeah, but not as much now. And, and, and uh, there's certainly an overlap, but I wouldn't call it more than an overlap. Right. Has sobriety changed that that predisposition at all? Like, did you go through that thing of like, I'm getting sober, I don't know if I can do these stunts anymore, or has it changed your relationship with that desire for attention? Uh, I think that before sobriety, I think I just genuinely didn't uh, believe that I was gonna live for very long. You know, like uh, one way or another, I just thought that I just wasn't gonna, like uh, that I was gonna die fairly young. So I was never really driven to try to like uh, hoard or hoard money, and, and and I just wasn't like particularly motivated by money. I've wanted like to have a legacy like forever, and so the video camera for me it was like all the video, all the, every project. Like, man, it's like my message in a bottle, and when I'm dead, this is gonna I'm gonna live forever. And so I was really hyper focused on that. And it was such bullshit. <laughs> and I remember sending you my famous George Harrison. Uh, email. You know, Harrison had died not too long before that after a life of drugs. And if anybody was ever going to be leaving a legacy, it would be one of the principles of the Beatles. And I said to Steve, you, know, you can say all this crap, but at the end of the day, if they don't care all that much about George Harrison's legacy, you know, who's going to really give a shit about yours? I think George Harrison's got a pretty dope I legacy. Think, yeah, <laughs> I, think, I think people do care about him a little bit. But, Sorry? I mean, people care about George Oh, Harrison's of course, but, but he, he's kind of lost. I mean, Lennon had more uh, charisma. Uh, uh -huh. uh, yeah, he, he, my point is, he died at age 58. Uh, for all the kind of preventable reasons that you were talking about on a lesser scale when you were beating up on me for my diet. I wasn't beating up on you. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 uh, I thought I was going easy on him. <laughs> yeah, I think you were too. I, I do the beating up. Uh, well, but the, uh, you know, the, the, the point is you live for yourself first and foremost, family and friends, uh, important seconds. And uh, who really cares about all the fans out there who are notoriously fickle and uh, will jump from one celebrity to another celebrity and evolve in their tastes. And I remember sending, I think I still have that email, and I don't think it carried all that much weight with you, but I thought it was epic. I'd be interested to see it, because I remember it, and I remember the idea of it, and I was like, oh, dad doesn't get it, like, I'm gnarly. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> But has your relationship to like what you do shifted as you've as you've yeah. gotten more sober? I think that uh, you know, as a function like of being an artist, like um, I guess like uh, I don't know. I just think like like and I, and I kind of say it a lot. Like I think that there's the, there's there's the the artist, and then like there's this whole new kind of arena of like the, like the person, which I never made room for before. You know, it was just constant, one hundred percent never turn off you know it was just always on and always like the persona of steve-o and uh, now i think that uh you know there's like a really like there's been like like you know like a concerted effort to uh to find separation between the persona and and like you know, the person mm -hmm. and um and it's a struggle man you know it's a struggle because like i'm still the attention whore like i'm still like like, ah, I gotta do this, I gotta do that. Like, I still, like, uh, just, you know, I, ha I just have aching desire to matter, you know? Right. Like, to, to matter and to be known and to be revered, and, and um, it's really hard for me to back off of that. But, so, but, but progress is being made, you know? Is that, is oh. that where the meditation comes in? You know, I feel like, like, uh, feel I, like a TM, right? I do, yeah, yeah. uh-huh. And uh, and I struggle with that, you know. I mean, I do it. I stick with it, and I, you know, like um, like uh, I'm 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 fairly diligent about it. But but it doesn't yeah. come easily to me, you know. And I don't yeah. I don't know. 
I think alcoholic and meditation this is just a tough mix. <laughs> well, I think it's I think it's hard for everyone. Yeah, I think it's particularly hard for somebody who's got who's prone to like you know the obsessive mind. Sure, but, 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 but you're obsessive. like hardly somebody you know eight years ago that somebody would have said Steve O's gonna be doing T you know TM. Right, I, hear that. I get it, man. I get it, and and uh, I'm so glad that that I do and stay, like even even when meditating is is terribly difficult and and when I'm like oh my god. I'm gonna, uh, I like, I'm just so glad I'm doing it. You know? let, let me get back to this thing about the persona. I mean, Steve Glover is a totally different person from Steve O. Uh, and those boundaries are pretty clear. What I think you're wrestling with now is that in between those two boundaries, there's kind of a gray zone. And uh, Steve Glover ne never invades the turf of Steve O, but Steve O can slip across the lines into Steve Glover. <laughs> mm. And to me, that's more a fine-tuning thing than a fundamental change. I think the fundamental change has taken place. I think it's trying to maintain the boundaries that is what yeah, you're talking about. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I, th I see it as such a, such a gnarly uphill battle, and, and uh, I really do, because, um, it, you know, like, it's, it's the, and and I would compare like like you like you you've always emphasized how important it is to have hobbies and uh, and, and interests. Yep. Uh, because like you 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 know you refer to countless people that you've known in uh, in the the business world who had job titles who were uh, very prestigious in their careers. And then from the moment that they retired or lost their job, whatever the case may be, as soon as they didn't have that prestigious job yep. title anymore, out, out the window went their, their whole identity, yep. all mm -hmm. of their self-esteem, and, like, and, and uh, without hobbies and interests, they were just depressing, like depressed lumps who just like, yeah. had lost yeah. everything. Putting it into a one-liner, sound bites are good, there's two kinds of retirees, those who are enjoying life and those who are waiting to die. Well, right, sure, but but now, like that's what what I relate to, is um, is 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 really that what, what you're yeah. talking about is the the guy who had the prestigious job title who no longer has it and now is depressed and and uh, and his life is miserable. Like I ref like I, I think of that because like when your uh, identity, when your your uh, happiness, when when your fulfillment in life comes from uh, the validation of, of uh, you know, of external sources, be it people for, for the prestige you carry, like that's, that's an issue. And we call it, in, in, in our terminology, we call it emotional sobriety. Mm -hmm. Like, like, like emo you can't be emotionally sober so long as you derive your, your fulfillment, your, your happiness, your serenity from external validation. Okay. And, 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 and by the virtue of being a, uh, an, an entertainer who, whose career is in the entertainment industry, it's really difficult to juggle that because, like, because my livelihood is in the validation right. of external sources, well, yet like that's not where the, so that the happiness needs to come from within. Like we're very clear on that. And for me, like the happiness, it's it, like the, the flow of happiness and fulfillment needs to cease to come from the value of Steve-O, the commodity and the entertainment industry and really needs to begin to come from from inside Stephen Glover and without external validation. Oh. And that is oh, sort of, oh, and, and you, oh. you would describe it as having hobbies and interests oh, and, and, and oh, okay. make yourself happy. In, in the words of JFK, let me tell you this about that. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait to hear this. <laughs> the, uh, uh, you've got interests and depth that you don't even know about. Well, uh, help, help me. And, uh, <laughs> I, I, tell me what it is. I, 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 I will never forget the time you, he came back He'd been shooting Wild Boys uh, in, in Africa, Rwanda. and he came back from Rwanda. And uh, he got to the house about 11 o'clock. It was a late flight coming in. We must have stayed up till 2.30 or 3 just talking. And uh, he started out telling me about Rwanda and got deeply into the atrocities of the, uh, the Rwanda genocide. genocide. 1994. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, he knew stuff about Rwanda having just been there. Uh, I was... 
I they, think it was after I had, like, after being in Rwanda and I read that book. Okay, well, but you came back from a trip. I think you maybe read the book on the airplane because the two seem to be pretty married together. Um, but y- y- you got into that with a knowledge and a depth that blew me away. And I don't know how it came up, but in the same conversation... Talk about Leonardo da Vinci. We shifted over to Leonardo da Vinci. <laughs> and I knew very, very little about Leonardo da Vinci. And Steve, who had read, read about the man blew me away with his knowledge and uh, the thing that uh, yeah, he knew and I, I was so thought provoking I'd never crossed my mind before is that uh, a testimony to da Vinci's greatness is that he was openly gay living in the I... era of the Spanish Inquisition mm-hmm. and was tolerated because he was so talented mm-hmm. in other areas. Yes. I don't know how openly gay he was. I think he was known to be gay. Well, what's the difference? I mean, in those right. days, what's the difference? I mean, right, the right, Spanish right, right. Inquisition was after you. I mean, you get into that. I, I can send you a uh, an article about the uh, you know ISIS about what you know. I don't know if I've kept you up to date on Turkish politics. I certainly send you stuff about the European Union. I mean, I can send you just about anything and you'll read it and discuss it with interest. And you're not a whole lot different from a corporate guy. So basically the point you're making is that the interior life of Stephen Glover, you know, exceeds the, you know, the sort of public perception of Stephen Glover. I'm I'm saying two things. That piece is a no-brainer. But I'm also saying that I think it exceeds what he recognizes in himself. Because when you're at, at the top of the corporate ladder and you're flying around in company airplanes, and, uh, you know, everybody bows and scrapes because of your title. And, you know, you want Super Bowl tickets, you flick your fingers and your secretary comes up with them somewhere. I mean, that's a lifestyle that is very, very ego-fueling. And you're right. When people walk out the door for the last time, a lot of them have left themselves behind, and they've got nothing to replace it with. And yet... You know, I've developed interest now in stuff that I wasn't aware that I was interested in when I was working and didn't have very much time. I certainly and, don't worry and, about, and, about your interest. And, <laughs> and, and, and you've got that reservoir that you haven't had the time to fully recognize, but it's there. And I think that's kind of a middle ground um, you know, that you will draw from at the appropriate time. Well, it's an interesting uh, conundrum, though, because you do need that sort of approval and validation and acceptance to be able to continue to pursue what you do and, and be you know, financially remunerated well, for it. Right. But it's about, it's about your relationship well, to that. Like, it's about your attachment to that. Like, are you neutral in your reaction in, your, in the way that you receive that? Or is there, you know, what is the ego component that right. connects well, you to that? Well, I, I, I used to describe uh, financial success as a three-tier process. The first tier is earning enough money that you can engage in your preferred lifestyle. And for some people that can be very minimal, for some people it can be very extravagant, but whatever it is, uh, and it's shaped by what you have at any point in time. But achieving your desired lifestyle is step one. Uh, Step two is accumulating enough assets that you secure that lifestyle almost regardless of what happens. So you lose your job, uh, you know, God forbid that he have an accident and never be able to do a stunt again or stand up. Yeah, enough money in the bank that the lifestyle isn't gonna suffer. Sure, there'll be adjustments, but the monetary side is taken care of, and that's step two. Step number three is what I'd describe as ego and raw power. And that's when people have far more than they need. And some people uh, give it to charities and other people play a real life monopoly game and buy and sell companies and strip out people's jobs and do all kinds of things just for the ego and the prestige. I think that's where it becomes a sickness. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, if you can get off the bus uh, at a point when you've achieved what you want to achieve, you've secured what you want to secure, and uh, you're no longer driven by the ego, it's a feasible scenario. That's the uh, that's the rock that you're pushing up the hill, right? That's and it has it. evolved because, like, you're not. I mean, with what you're doing now, it's yeah. There's stunts and there's you know, it's Stevo being Stevo, but it's more performance art, you know, and comedy. Like, it has changed. 
And it, there's, right. another, there's another theme that I've been on. And I, I, if I'm talking too much, shut me up. But I, I, no, I love it. No. Uh, I have been beating up on Steve for probably 10 years now to assume the role as CEO of his own company. And at the very beginning, one of Steve's fam infamous quotes was, he was in charge of creative, and he let the other guys take over the numbers. And guess what? He got ripped off and taken to the cleaners. <laughs> and uh, I said, y you got to be responsible. you got to learn to manage people. you got to learn to delegate. And you got to be willing to kick ass and enforce high performance standards. And every time he complains on the phone or when we're together and says, so-and-so let me down, or uh, I think I ought to get rid of such and such. He's not performing anymore. Uh, my stock answer is, hey, it's not his fault. It's your fault. Mm. Yeah, whoever, well, I mean, some people are grossly incompetent. You find them out in six months and they're gone. But a person who has been performing at a satisfactory or better level for a number of years who suddenly stops performing, it's because they haven't had their ass kicked. They haven't had their <laughs> performance standards clearly defined. And enormous progress is being made in that front. And I believe at some point, Steve, if he chose to, would be capable of buying into a uh, viable business and running it as a businessman. Yeah, well, I mean, beyond the, the talent and the you know, sheer insanity of what he does, clearly a lot of your insight has rubbed off on him because you know, you've had tremendous longevity in this business. I mean, it could have been like a flash in the pan thing, you know, see you later like oh right. this guy does crazy stunts but like you've actually cultivated a life and, and and a lot of staying power in this town which is not easy and that only happens when you know you're making smart decisions and you you do have an entrepreneurial you know yeah, sort of relationship with what you do you know there's definitely this uh you know there's this insane drive that that i've had and, and um you know the the persistence and the the, the just drive and, I, and I'm sure that comes from dad and and uh, everything else that's rubbed off on me from dad um, I, I've been very fortunate you know and and uh, and then I've worked hard and you know and and that's key you have worked hard yeah and uh, you've earned everything you've got and you can look around and the field is littered with people that had you know, similar opportunities and failed to capitalize on them yeah, that probably gets missed, you know, by most people who just think like, oh, it's just easy for Steve-O, you know, just do crazy stuff and everyone pays attention. It's, it's well, a lot it's more easy. complicated than that. So you're, so you're proud. Very, very much fun, so. Right? Very yeah. much so. And Steve, you got the, you got the Showtime special now. You're traveling like a crazy it, man. It is. Well, well again, it's uh, the Showtime special is now, if, if you go on my Instagram, in the bio of my Instagram, there's a link to... Uh, to what I consider to be the craziest one-man show that's ever been recorded. Yeah, I, this this whole thing came together so quickly. I haven't had a chance to check it out yet. Oh, no I'm worries, man. It's it, all man. good. It's I, but I, I know it's like it's comedy, it's stunts, it's craziness. It's like you're it's, interacting it's, with it's, the audience. It's, uh, it's something I worked on for five years of touring, you know, for all the material, and um, and uh, it's just the, and I, I peppered stunts throughout it that are just real heavy and and. Uh, entertaining man like at the end of the day it's a it's a cohesive one-man show where i tell my story and punctuate it with intense stunts uh -huh. throughout and and the the end result is it's a it's the craziest most entertaining one-man show comedy special like i think it's ever been recorded yeah, yeah. <laughs> and i say that like kind of brashly but uh you know and, and at the risk of sounding douchey i just i couldn't be more thrilled with how it came out and and uh you know and I continue to, now I'm on to the next one. You right. Know? So doing, you're going to do another special and you're just touring. Well, ultimately, like, uh, I'm touring, you know, like, it, like, regardless of how that special performed on Showtime, even though it performed very well, but now in this, in this you know, in this landscape of media that's so fragmented and, and uh, it's so impossible to, to really, like, reach that many people, like, you know, whether or not uh, that many people uh, see my comedy special, um, I, you know, the fact is that, that I've been touring as a stand-up comedian and, you know, one-man variety performer um, for almost six years now. And, um, and being a part of this comedy circuit, I've gone back to the same places, 
the same, you know, the same venues in the same cities time and time again some, to, to the point where some, some comedy clubs I've been to five times, like every year right. for each of the five years. I feel like you keep going back to Ohio. Right, yeah, I go back to Ohio, Ohio a yeah. lot. Uh-huh. Um, Utah I've been to a lot. So anytime I go back to a place that I've been to before, um, if, if, and if, if I repeat material that I performed when I was there the, the one time before, like as I do it from the stage, I feel like all I can think about is there's got that I know there's there are people in this audience who mm-hmm. were, saw me here the last time I was here. And and if there's if they're here and they're and and I'm doing the same show I did the last time I just I'm gonna feel like such a fraud, I'm gonna feel like I'm jipping them. I'm gonna just like it just eats me alive from the inside out. And so uh, so yeah, I'm just I'm just thrilled to have taken like that that you know that what I put on that comedy special, put it out there, retire it, and be be doing all Do new know, material. All new, all new, yeah, yeah, but that's a, that's an interesting point because. Uh, when you go on TV, you're not going club by club. I mean, now you're out there, it's in the archives, people can refer back to it. And it puts far more pressure to uh, change the material and evolve the material. And uh, one of the discussions we've been having is, what next? I mean, if stand-up is going to continue, then at some point it needs to evolve from you know, Steve-O's life history and a few crazy stunts into somewhat more mainstream mm. that provides a vehicle for changing the material. Right, sure. And, and that's going to be a challenge. But you, will, you will meet it. You will meet it. But, I mean, this is kind of an example of a later stage evolution in sure. what he's doing. Like yeah. a Louis C.K. sort of evolution into... Sure. I mean, and there's, like, there's a bunch of, uh, of material that, that qualifies as stand-up. It's not autobiographical in nature that I chose to uh, to leave out of the comedy special because I felt that for for my comedy special, it uh, it's a, tra- a, a transitional piece. People are like aren't necessarily ready to swallow Steve-O, the stand-up comedian. Right. So so by by having emphasis on stunts being part of that show and uh, you got to the, break them the in. Right, I got to lure them in with the stunts <laughs> yeah. and then kind of convert them with the comedy. And uh, in order to make the comedy more palatable, have it be like totally autobiographical and like, wow, we're gonna hear these crazy true stories about like what went on, like you know, during Jackass behind the scenes, like what the the kind of impact was on Steve's life and you know this and that. And uh, and it's all gonna be shocking and juicy throughout. And by the end of it. Um, Wow, you know this guy's a performer, and he can actually like get on stage and, and entertain people with uh, spoken yeah, yeah. word. You know, and he's making my point because he's thinking strategically, and planning ahead, and foreseeing the evolution, That's a and working piece, very, yeah. very hard uh-huh. to do it. And there are a lot of people that just go out and figure we give them the same old shit, and I'll be funnier if I've had a few drinks under my belt, and uh, we go on to the next town tomorrow. So you know, it doesn't have to be new. I mean. There's two different standards, and he consistently goes after the higher standard. Yeah, it's great, man. And well, uh, thanks, so man. just keep keep doing it. Like, our, I know you got like a like a movie project you're working on. I'm working other on things, a movie some project. Other yeah, stuff coming up. Is and there and is there ever gonna be another Jackass? It's not happening. I doubt it, man. Like, yeah. uh, we gotta get all the guys healthy, you know. Right. Like, uh, I should say the remaining guys, which is a sad thing to say, but uh, yeah, if uh, you know, the guys that are healthy, some of the guys are. Uh, you know, it can free up their time. <laughs> you know? right. Well, it's like a band that's been around for a long time and everyone right. just has a life now, right? They, they missed an opportunity. I remember at the uh, premiere for Jackass 2, after far too many scotches, sitting in a hotel room uh, with Jeff Tremaine and saying pretty much the same thing. I said, Jeff, you can't keep making this stuff more and more dangerous. It's going to implode that's what they're saying I, about I, reality tv well, but, but like but but, 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 I, but i broke it down into, in you know into three components i said there's pain and danger which is one and that's the piece that's being outgrown and you have to evolve away from there's rank gross filth and that'll probably <laughs> always be part of the the uh, proposition but it may have a more narrow appeal than you'd like and then the third piece is genuine humor and if you can move it up that scale and get to a point where genuine humor takes on a larger piece, 
then there's got to be scope for a lot more of these. If well, you, I'll, I think that the I'll bad, take it one. Bad grandpa accomplished that. Right? Yeah. Yeah, but that wasn't Jackass. It was yeah. sort of Jackass, but it was basically Knoxville's scripted movie getting away from the uh, uh, tradition in his way of getting away from it. Right. Just like you're planning on your upcoming project. But the point is, if there had been an early adoption of the view that we can make people laugh without having to hurt ourselves or put ourselves at risk, it would have been more feasible to yeah. extend. I got that, but I think I think you're overlooking the the most important aspect in the kind of success equation of Jackass, which is the camaraderie amongst all you guys and the level of endearment. You know, like there's a lot of love between all you guys, and that whether it's it's it doesn't have to be stated overtly, but like that is so like clear and present when you watch those movies and I think that's what allows the audience member to like really tap in and go on that journey because you guys like you know you guys care about each other and and it's not just like it's not just in isolation like doing crazy stuff like you guys sure. were all in it right, for the course. for the win together but tell them the story of sad ass uh, well I mean it's <laughs> it's just that every every so often um there would be uh, like one of the typically one of the, the, the this one guy from Jackass will will initiate an email, uh, you know, to the whole cast and Spike Jones and Knoxville Tremaine, you know, um, saying like, "Come on, guys, come on!" Like trying to rally to get right. like a fourth Jackass movie um, underway, and um, it generally like uh, doesn't catch fire, <laughs> you know. Like mm -hmm. there's, there's not really a response. Um, I, I responded to the last one by saying, "Hey, you know, I was in um, Tampa promoting shows on the radio, and this this uh, radio DJ guy named Mike Calta said something that really was impactful to me. He said that when he went to the theater to watch Jackass 3D, that he went with." Uh, a fear, the nervousness that it would have reached a point already that it was it had become sad mm -hmm. to watch us, you know, advance right. in age and continue to do these things. Right, right, right. He said, I was just I was worried for you that it would have become sad to watch you guys do that. He said, however, that he was relieved that um, that in fact it would prove you know, to him that we were still getting away with it. It was still funny. The magic was still there and it was great. And, and yeah, but you and, don't want to cross over. Right. And, and, and as he told me that, I remember thinking like, man, you know, he's got a point, you know, and like, uh, whenever anybody asks me about like, are you going to make a jackass four? I think of that conversation with Mike Calton in Tampa. And I, and I, and I, and I relate, I, I related this to the, to the guys in the email thread. And I said, Hey, you know, um, now, like what, the point that that guy was talking about, now we're, now we're six years later. Now, like if we get together and we may try to make a Jackass 4, like the elephant in the room mm -hmm. is, wow, these guys are fucking old, you know? <laughs> like the, like the, it's the elephant in the room, yeah. there's no way around it, you yeah. know? And I said, I'm with all of you, like, uh, you know, like um, I, 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 lo I love all of you guys, you know, I miss you guys, and, and like all the enthusiasm is there. You know, like uh, for us to get together and do something, I just said I feel that it's it's important whatever we do do that we get out in front of that right. and we acknowledge. Okay, now it's fucking getting to a point. Now it's fucking ridiculous. Yeah. Now we're like now we're old and and uh, and if there's a way to kind of uh, to modify what we're doing, if it's something like what my dad's talking about over here, or if uh, if there's a way to um, just acknowledge it, to tweak it. I think that there's a project for us to, to do, like mm -hmm. under the name of Jackass with all of us involved. I just don't think that we could get away with sort of, you know, like the same format and without acknowledging it, without getting in front of it. No, you would have my, to. I mean, maybe you I, recruit the next wave, you know, and train them up. Yeah, or, you who, know, who knows? Like but, um, but the funniest thing, and I laughed out loud, uh, one of the guys responded with a, uh, a graphic, a mock-up of, uh, of a Jackass 4 movie poster. It had like, uh, for, the, for the A, it was uh, the number four. Uh -huh. You know, but it said sad ass. <laughs> <laughs> That's so good. Well, I think it was for the third, Trapper, was it the third one that they came? So you got, I don't know if you were there because I wasn't home this day, but I know Tremaine and a bunch of crew guys came to our house to scout for Jackass 3. 
for some crazy stunt. What do they want to do? Like ride a jet ski uh, down the, the jet, pool? Yeah, the jet, the wave runner thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. and like go because our pool goes off like this edge, and there's oh, a that hill where that goes we did down. That? You I didn't end there. up using the house, but like everybody came to check it out, and it's I was like, like a super long narrow pool. Exactly. And that's your house. That's, yeah, yeah, it's my house. It's like a railing, the other end is like plate glass. Yeah. Like I mean, you would know if uh, if it happened. Like there, it's right? yeah, it's, it's like long. And, well, you know, you didn't film there, but you guys all came uh, out and scouted, and then uh, okay. maybe you found somewhere else or yeah, whatever. Yeah, okay, I wasn't there. But for I that. was like, I was like, please let that happen. Like, I, we <laughs> gotta have jackass happen at the house. Right, it didn't work out. But yeah, but it's great because um, you know, like I don't think there's gonna be another jackass four. I kind of feel like that that ship has sailed. I personally got sick and tired of waiting, you mm-hmm. know, for it to happen, and so I wrote this this uh, movie idea. Um, that I'm pursuing, I'm trying to get him make it happen, and I'm like hopeful that uh, that I'm going gonna make it happen. And um, it's a it's a scripted thing that involves all kinds of sight gags and crazy stunts and and uh, and a story. And um, by the virtue of it having a story, I'm able to easily get out in front of it and right. be like, yeah, you know, acknowledging the very first scene, like you know, like uh, yeah, I'm too old to be doing this. Yeah, do it well, anyway. <laughs> that's great, man. I hope, I hope that happens. And, I do too, uh, man. And uh, you know, and, and this is um, this is uh, this is where like what Dad describes as my comfort zone, you know, which I I've more affectionately referred to as the the narrow slice of the pie, which I uh, within which I apply myself fully. You uh-huh. know, the comfort zone is widening. It's taking long, slow painful yeah but i don't even think it's necessarily widening i just think this this movie project falls into the category of shit that i will fucking pursue until it happens right 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 (laughs) yeah Yeah. but you're into the contract you're into the numbers you're into the uh uh you're dealing with it at a much broader and higher level than you would have 10 years ago yeah you got good people on your team and all that yeah i got to deal with uh an incredibly reputable movie producer who's made all kinds of uh he's made like 175 movies Mm -hmm. and knows exactly what he's doing Doing. and uh we've you know we've got a deal between us we've got the 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 deal with the script guy and the the script guy is like you know i wrote it but he's making it like uh, mm-hmm. official so we'll see what happens man nice man well uh congrats on the special thank you so much and man. uh it's great talking to you guys man Dude. this is really no i mean honestly i felt like i'm just eavesdropping on you know this conversation between father and son yeah and how about these really organic special. moments where like no nope, you've got that wrong yeah i know son. you i know <laughs> like whoa i know i mean ted i you know I it's never like said that. i said this you've never done a podcast you did amazing and uh i appreciate you being honest and and open I, I still don't even like, know cool. what I did. I just yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <That's fine. Yeah. laughs> well, cool. All right, I mean, I think uh, yeah. The last thing I want to say is just you, you know I think that uh, you're an inspiration with your sobriety, man. And I've seen you, uh, you know, I've seen you over the years, and you really you you, you don't just talk the talk, man. You walk the walk, and you well, know, thanks, I've seen man. the growth, and uh, it's cool. So keep, I appreciate that a lot, Rich, it. and, and uh, you know I feel the same way about you, brother. It's been it's been great to, to be trudging the road together. That's right, man. Yeah, and I'm Thanks, gonna make dude. vegan smoothies. Do you ready? Right. Awesome. <laughs> Do it. Thanks, you guys. Peace.